Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do. It's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome uh, to our Tuesday, December 17, Sioux Falls City Council meeting. Uh, Merry Christmas. Thanks for being here this evening, for joining us online. We'll go ahead and get cracking and uh, ask Tom to read our roll, please. Council members Erickson. Here. Hiley. Here. Heitzert. Here. Selberg. Here. Sale. Here. Star. Here. Daly. Here. Brecky. Here. All right, here to give our invocation tonight, we're uh, lucky to have Pest Pastor Fred Wilgenberg from uh, New Roots Ministry with us. And uh, we ask that you rise for the invocation and stay standing. We'll have our Pledge of Allegiance uh, right after. Let us pray. Our great God, source of, of all of life and uh, source of wisdom, grace, and love, we are gathered here before you and asking for your blessing upon this evening. We ask that you would bless uh, those who are struggling in uh, maybe, maybe having to sleep outside or uh, just out in the cold, maybe hungry, that your grace and your love would be felt by them and be, you would touch the, each of them and help them. We ask that you would bless your public servants, such as the police department, the officers, and the fire department, and all those in the medical fields who, who take care of us and, and those who struggle, that you would keep them safe, that the public service can sense our appreciation for them and also yours. We lift up to you in prayer our youth, our next generation, that, that they may sense uh, their importance to this community and your wonderful plans that you have for each of them and that um, they may know that even though maybe others, they, they may not feel that others like them or struggling in the time of youth with peer pressure, that they may know that they always uh, measure up in your eyes and, and your love for them is great. Bless them and give them a sense of the great plans and purpose you have for them. We lift up all those in Sioux Falls, each of us, every one of us, that we may ultimately be good to one another and that that may come uh, through you, Holy Spirit, you who are the, uh, that you would, the fruits of your spirit may be upon us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. And you say in your word that against such things there is no law. And finally, in this time of prayer, we, we lift up these servants, our city officials, uh, the city council members, the mayor and the staff, that uh, this evening and each week and each day and each hour, your wisdom, uh, your blessing, your grace, your guidance, uh, would be upon them, and they would feel you and, and feel your help, and turn to you. And Jesus, we pray all this in your name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Staley to join me up front. We have a couple special presentations tonight. Welcome. Um, tonight, we're, I, I nominated my dear friend, mentor, and teacher, Kermit Stagers, to get, receive our Super Citizen Award. And here's a few words about Kermit. Always the public servant, Kermit served in the South Dakota State Senate from 1995 to 2002 and was elected to the City Council Central and at-large districts from 2002 to 2010, and then again from 2012 to 2016. During Steger's political career, he was most noted for trying to get rid of the state income tax and tax on food, and for advocating for our beloved snow gates. 
state death tax, thank you. Always respectful of other people's opinions, Kermit supported public debate and open transparency rather than behind closed doors dealings. Kermit taught political science and government at USF for 30 years. Many of his students have become more civically involved as a result of his inspiration in the classroom. Stagers belong to several organizations, including the Siouxland Heritage Museum, Kiwanis, the Fulbright Association, Great Plains Political Science Association, and the National Eagle Scout Association. Kermit and his grandson Elijah, who are, who's here today, are both Eagle Scouts. And Matthew, who is also here, the younger grandson will receive his Eagle Scout honor soon. And I see that we had some scouts here earlier. Are they still here? Oh, yes, wonderful. For the past 20 years, Kermit and June have been members of First Christian Church of Sioux Falls, and in the latter years, they were elders in the church as well. Kermit and June have two children, Ann Kristen, who is over here next to June, and Kyle Lee. Ann is now a banker and is married to Aaron Bird. They have two children, Elijah and Matthew. Kyle Lee currently lives in Denver and is a flight medic. During Stager's lifetime, he received many awards, including the Distinguished Young Men of America, Countless Who's Who in America, Who's Who in the World, and Guardian of Small Businesses. Kermit was always willing to help others without ever counting the cost. He died on Thanksgiving Eve with his lovely family at his side. So I'm so pleased to offer to June today the Super Citizen Award on behalf of Kermit. I want to say a few words. I want to thank the Sioux Falls City Council for this award. Um, Kermit's always been blessed by knowing they lived in a community that was a both large and small. We always had neighbors, and we always had opportunities in this city. So I appreciated that. And uh, I, as his wife, I appreciated Kermit and the opportunities the city and state gave us. So thank you very much. All right, we have uh, one other superhero award tonight, um, and it's my honor to present it to this guy, uh, Dave and Mary Ann Capasso. So I'd like to invite Dave and your lovely wife. You've got to come up here, too. I'm sorry. It's part of the gig, for better or worse, right? 43 years. So um, I'm going to read a little piece here, then I'll go off script a little bit. So natural leaders are born with an innate sense to serve. They don't view their desire to help people as a season that begins and ends. They're always available when needed. We've been blessed in our community with one of those leaders. Dr. Dave Kapaska served as the regional president and CEO of Avera McKinnon Hospital from 2010 to 2017. And during this time, he also served as a chair of the board for the Sioux Falls Area Chamber of Commerce. And he retired from both of those roles at the end of 2017. And he thought he'd go peacefully into the sunset, to his place in Nevada, and enjoy the winters there. Fast forward to 2019, when the president and CEO of the chamber resigned this past summer and moved out of state, there was concern that the business community might go without a leader for quite some time while our national search was conducted. And enter Dr. K. Everyone calls him Dr. K. Dr. K, who had been enjoying a nice retirement with his wife and wintering in a much milder climate than we enjoy in Sioux Falls. Dr. K offered to serve as interim president of the Sioux Falls Area Chamber of Commerce and head up the search for the next leader of the organization. His days are now spent attending meetings and events, managing the chamber staff of 18, and looking out for the best interests of our business community. 
Dr. K's tenacity and leadership has made a profound impact on the chamber during this time of uh, being an interim. His dedication and commitment to helping the community growing businesses and sharing his time and leadership talents is what makes him a true superhero. And I've got a chance to sit in a lot of meetings with you, man, over the last several months. And uh, you're just a real steady hand at the wheel during the time of transition in our chamber. Uh, we both are very confident in our next chamber leader, Jeff Griffin. But man, it was so nice to have you take over for a while, Dr. K. We're going to miss you. Uh, I hope we never have to see you in this role again. Um, but thanks for all your leadership over the past few months. It, I appreciate it. I appreciate You going to stay for the whole meeting too, Dr. K? I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. Good answer, man. Uh, all right. We'll move on to uh, item number five, which is our consent agenda. Move to approve Erickson. Second. All right. Motion to approve by uh, Councilor Erickson, seconded by Kylie. Any discussion on the consent agenda, yeah, Council? Mr. Council Mayor, um, I would like to pull item number five, facilities management for the citywide garbage and recycling services, please. All right. Any other uh, changes, Council? All right. We'll take a vote on that then, please. Council Members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. All right. That item passes uh, 8 to 0. We're on to our next item, item 18, which will be our regular agenda approval. Move to approve Erickson. Second, Selberg. All right. Motion approved by Erickson, seconded by Selberg. Discussion on that, Council? All right, we'll take a vote on that one, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Elberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0, and we're on to our general public input portion of our agenda for tonight. As a reminder, input during this portion will last no more than three minutes per person, uh, and in total lasts no more than 30 minutes. During general public input, the public is welcome to speak on any topic that does not appear later on in the agenda. For regular agenda items following general public input, comments are limited to three minutes uh, unless the item is being presented for final adoption, in which case public input is limited to five minutes. For all regular agenda items, comments are limited to the agenda item under consideration only. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, anyone forward for general public input. Clerk, please note our time is 7.13. Good evening. Good evening. I'm David Sokaitis, and it's the last council meeting before Christmas, and I came up here to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Good way to start off the, the end of the year. But before you go, what good is a Christmas celebration without a few cookies? So I brought some in. They're over there. They're made with whole wheat and uh, Steel cut oats and raw sugar, and they're really good. So, Merry Christmas, everybody. All right. Thanks, David. You going to top that one, Bruce? Good evening. I sure will. All right. I have uh, I've brought some hand sanitizer for those that feel like they need hand sanitizer either before or after I get here. Uh, Bruce Danielson, I had a, uh, I sent all of you an email recently, uh, and I, well, I want to just bring it to mind that, that there's a, an issue that's, that uh, might be coming up tonight, uh, it'll be here, uh, but it has many of us concerned, and I wanted to give a, uh, this is, an, this is an agenda item. Do you want to speak on this during the agenda item? No, I'm not going to speak on that agenda item. I know enough about this place to know I can't do that. But what I want to do is remind those 
that were the subject of that email, which I've laid right here, uh, and all of you have received a copy of it, that th there are those of us looking at it and want to make sure that, that uh, you remember that recusal is an important thing when it comes to items that come before you on this on the agenda. Then I also wanted to let you know that 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 apparently we uh, we have a city government supporting the efforts of Michael Bloomberg running for president, and there's an organization that is formed by the data that our city has supplied to the Mike Bloomberg operation that is now being used in an organization called uh, Mayors for Mike. So I wanted to make sure that everybody understands that, that, that we have sent people to this Harvard or Hobbard uh, operation to learn how to manage our city. We've had these people involved in helping organize the transit task force, uh, come up with ideas that supposedly have been tried in other cities and failed, but we're gonna do them anyway because somehow giving them all our data is important to making this happen. I happened to be looking at my New York Times subscription the other night, or the other day, and I saw this out there and made me think I need to bring some hand sanitizer for all of us, and I can put this over here on the counter if you feel like you need it when I'm done. So I just want to uh, help you understand the first issue was, was the fact that we have, that we have a, uh, a campaign organization that is set up. We know that there's individuals who are willing to raise $100,000 to $150,000 to defeat certain candidates for the city council. We have a, uh, apparently a secret uh, PAC that is set up to, to uh, help make that happen. Thank so you, Bruce. Anyone else this evening? Hello, I'm Catherine Riffle. I'm an advocate for the homeless and uh, displaced persons here in Sioux Falls. Uh, it had come to my attention by getting here the last time for the other meeting, a uh, week before last, that Housing and uh, Homeless Coalition blew $184 million the wrong way within 10 years span. Since I have been champion for us to get a place for the people on the streets, my other directors have called me today We've had a meeting long distance. We've come to the decision that we're gonna hold everyone responsible from city council, county commissioners, housing, and homeless coalition for the deaths of people, the suicide of people, and the lack of housing to be provided for the persons on the streets in the last 10 years. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Good evening. Mike, Mike Zinder, Sioux Falls, 909. I'm new at this. I'm av kind of like Kermit Stegers, I'm an advocate for lower taxes. We, we got, I just made a list of all the taxes that we pay in Sioux Falls. You know, might be missing some, but we're, we got to remind ourselves we're forcing to reside in a state, in a state that we're, we enjoy a, a, an economic boom, a population boom. Uh, outstanding, out, uh, you know. According to the, according to the, our city's own financial reports, we we average we, we grow by three thousand to four thousand people per year. Th those residents are responsible for paying paying most the majority of all the city taxes. Those residents are responsible for providing the city of most of its revenue. Where, where it's nice to, well, it's nice to create such a strong tax base. However, we 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 keep raising the rates over of our user fees every year to support our in, in, invest in our enterprise funds. A look at the enterprise funds. So we 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 keep large profits, large profits, in those funds, which is good, as the, as we can use those profits to invest back in the enterprise funds themselves. But I, I feel it's time to discuss, discuss, have a discussion, to lower our sales tax rates. We we did it once before in 2005 when we lowered it to 1.9. I think we can do it again. I think we're in a pretty good position. The reason, the reason we increased the, the tax rate back in 2000, 2009 was to invest in, in, in the enterprise funds themselves. 
We are, we are in a much better position, but therefore I lobby this body to lower our sales tax rate by 10%, 10, 12% to help the, the citizens of Sioux Falls keep more money in their pockets. Allow the citizens to keep an extra 25 cents per, per every dollar they spend would allow them to invest more money in their, in their properties and spend more money in, in, on goods and services. We, we win, we win, it's a win-win for everybody. I say cut the first penny down to 77.75%, 75 cents and keep the second penny at 1% to ensure that we can keep investing in capital assets, let alone we place a greater emphasis on our, on our user base enterprise and, and to continue investing in the enterprise funds. A brief look at our population and sales tax trends shows that we, we, we increase our sales, we, the sales tax will not, will not fall, will not, will always increase. This will not take away our pre, from our previous revenues. In fact, the, I believe the revenues will actually grow with a, as we grow in population. Why not give the citizens a, a tax cut on the sales tax when we, when we give the land developers and landowners a t discounts and, and credits on the, on the TIFs? Why, why Thanks, not? Mike. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. Good evening. Hi, Stephen Ciano here. Um, um, I talked last week, the week before, and I heard uh, Councillor Brecky uh, question a couple of weeks ago about the uh, use of outside lawyers when the city attorneys, uh, of which there are, I believe, seven, um, certainly should be tasked with doing the city's business. And yet last week, I then saw somebody with Davenport Evans come up here, apparently hired by the city to do the work of the city attorneys. And I don't understand how this can uh, be done. Um, I've pointed out that uh, Colleen Moran in particular was in charge of the uh, human relations department where I, uh, I went uh, I think it was about eight, ten years ago this uh, was going on, saying that I've been discriminated against for my disability and my beliefs, and I need help, and the matter was never referred. Um, this, as I also pointed out, was, as, as I believe, the primary or secondary uh, duty of the city attorneys um, is to serve the public, and uh, as a disabled person, um, being discriminated against for my beliefs on various levels, I have had my life threatened. This is serious. Um, you, you people, uh, when people are uh, tasked with something and they're not performing their duties, but instead are paying somebody else to do what they're being paid by the public dollar to, to, uh, to do, well, I see uh, some criminal activity uh, suggested in that, and I hope that all of you will review that uh, further. Uh, so I'm going to just leave it at that today. Uh, with, well, with the exception of I've seen you people um, cite recusal, personal recusal, which uh, my predecessor here tonight just um, mentioned. And I do see that um, if you were to take this recusal policy seriously, I do believe that every time I and perhaps others come up here, it would be incumbent upon you to recuse yourselves, all of you. Thank you. Anyone else this evening for public input? All right, clerk, we'll move on to our next item, please. Mayor, the next item was the item pulled from contracts and agreements on the consent agenda, sub item number five. Department of Facilities Management, the project description is citywide garbage and recycling services, vendors waste connections of South Dakota Incorporated in the amount of an increase per service location of 27%. Councilor Staley? Yes, is, is there someone from that department here? I don't believe so, Speak. or yes, Scott uh, is Because I, I said we were pulling it yesterday, so. Just to help us understand what this is about, Scott. Yeah, yeah, Scott Rust, uh, Finance Department. Um, Thanks for taking some time to pull this one um, for further explanation. 
Uh, the recycling market is obviously in a little bit of a, um, a, a little bit of a downturn for the last 18 months. We've um, seen a lot of changes with the, uh, the with the tariffs that are out there. Again, single stream recycling is, um, is is really doesn't have a place for it to go. A lot of this stuff was shipped to China. Um, now this stuff is being shipped to local mills within, within uh, the U.S. Um, long story short, uh, Novak Sanitation, who has a city contract, um, went from the city not paying anything for single stream recycling to $30 a ton to now $60 a ton, and there's really no end in sight. Um, so they've asked us uh, to negotiate with them and what we think is a fair rate for the next uh, year on this contract. So. Um, we, we came up with a 27% is the number, but in, in actuality, it's roughly around $1,200 a month on average to the, to the city uh, for an increase um, for the recycling fees. That, that we're going to pay to Novak. We're going to pay it to Novak, but we're in the same position that, you know, say Sanford Health is and everybody else, and they're negotiating with them. It, it, we're not alone in this. Everybody that they deal with as customers and all the other haulers have the same situation. Okay, and, and I would like to call Jesse from AOK -OK up, and if, if the, no, the Novak guy wants to come up as well. He's, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, they're, 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 they're back there. Bet. Yes. So my concern on this, when I see 27% increase, whether it's a cost to the city or a cost to the citizens, I, I want to know, as far as residential service, how this is playing out to, to our, uh, our residents. So, Jesse, if you want to address that, please. I will. Jesse with AOK -OK Sanitary Service. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think we need your last name, too. Jesse DeWitt with AOK -OK Sanitary Service. Uh, residentially speaking, it's not quite as impacted as it is commercially because residential is a lot more easy to enforce. Um, the things that we're getting with single stream is, yes, the rates are going up. We have raised rates to accommodate for that but it's the, the excessive charges that we're getting, like the contamination, the bags, and the heavy glass that we get that really spikes the recycling charges. And we see a lot more of that over the commercial side of things because it's a lot harder to really, really keep that under wraps. You know, you got multiple people putting it in the same container and not everyone does it the same, and that really does contaminate the load. Um, it's really hard to handle that, whereas you have a residential house where you may have five people in the house uh, you can you can call that person on an individual basis and say, hey, we need to get your stuff cleaned up. So we haven't had to raise the the residential side as much, but commercially we had to go through on on our side. I can't speak for waste connections, but on our side we had to go through each one of them individually, talk to the drivers and talk about how much, uh, like I said, the the garbage contamination, the heavy bagging, and the heavy glass, uh, and we had to adjust rates accordingly. Some went up very minor. Some may have doubled or tripled. Uh, so 20, when I heard 27%, I actually didn't think that was a bad uh, mark for on the commercial side. And also, just to, on a footnote on the recycling aspect, I know we spent $40,000 within our city to come up with a new logo for some recycling um, information that we're putting in the water bills. And I believe it was your mother uh, that I spoke with said that they're actually, as far as a garbage ha hauler, you're happy to have that information put out, that that is good to have more recycling knowledge um, given out to the community. Yeah, it definitely does help. The things that the Solid Waste Planning Board and the city has done to help the garbage haulers with education, with the ads, uh, the literature that they give us to hand out to our customers, the stickers they provide to put on cans has all definitely helped. But And that... It, we see that help more again on the residential side because they're, the people who are doing it are wanting to do it right and we can, everyone works together really well, but when you get into multi-housing or businesses where you have people coming to your door, especially in the public uh, side of it where you, know, you can't control what, what's coming in and out of your guys' buildings and going into your cans, it's a lot harder to do that. Did you want to add anything? Uh, Mike Herbst from Novak Sanitary Service, uh, just here to answer any further questions you may have. And have you had to raise your rates because of this? We have, uh, and much like, I'll, I'll echo Jesse to some extent, uh, we go through and do an analysis on each of our accounts, commercial, residential, and, and even construction, and then try to limit the amount as much as possible for our residential, of course, that's the people that we're impacting, but we also have the best relationship with them on the street. So we can clean that up. We've had great response, and I think that our, our percentages of, or a reduction in the contamination 
is very significant compared to the commercial and public building sector. Uh, just for example, walking through this building, there's a plastic bag in the recycling can in this building. That's every city building. That's every, uh, you know, commercial building. You go into the hospitals, you go into the mall, and there's really no way to regulate, one, what goes into it for the contamination, but two, how to control it without using a bag. And the bags are really the biggest piece of that increase uh, with excessive bags along with the contamination. So if we could get people to, to adhere to that, we could maybe lower rates? I think it would be able to stabilize rates. That's a very good thing to know. Okay, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Any other discussion on that? Can I get a motion? Move to approve, Erickson. Second. All right, motion approved by Councilor Erickson, seconded by Selberg. Any other discussion? All right, we'll take a vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Haley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Our next item, please. Next item is item 20, deferred from the meeting of Monday, November 18, 2019, and deferred from the meeting of Tuesday, December 3, 2019, 2020 renewal of Packer, package liquor license for Walea Convenience Store, 812 East 10th Street, pending motion from the meeting of November 18, 2019. A motion was made by Councilmember Erickson and seconded by Councilmember Neitzer to approve the 2020 renewal of a package liquor license for Walea Convenience Store, 812 East 10th Street. All right, thanks, Tom. Is anyone from the public wish to speak on this item? Please come forward. Good evening, council members. My name is Tyler Coverdale and with the Gooseman Law Firm and I represent Walia Convenience Store. I'd like to introduce my client, Almaz, her daughter, Amabetta, and Michael Alamu, her son-in-law. Almaz is the owner of Walia Convenience Store. I'm going to briefly speak on behalf of her and then her daughter is gonna say a few words on her mother's behalf and myself and Mr. Alamu will be available for any questions any of you may have. Almaz is an Ethiopian immigrant who came to this country in 1996 to build a better life for herself and her daughter. When she arrived, she worked and saved for years to purchase her business, Wiley Convenience Store. Almaz has now owned and operated the store for 10 years, growing it into a successful and profitable business. She invested in the neighborhood, as other family members also own businesses in the area, and she dreams of passing this business on to her family. She desires to work with the city and her neighbors to improve the neighborhood and to address the problems that have led here tonight. The issues that the Whittier neighborhood faces have worsened in recent years. As I mentioned, the Wallia Convenience Store has been in the neighborhood for over a decade, and many of those years were mostly uneventful. However, problems have significantly worsened in recent years. In part, we believe due to a uh, perhaps alteration in the police presence in the neighborhood. It is my client's understanding that in recent years, or in previous years, there were several police officers who were assigned to patrol the area on bicycles. And it is their understanding that this presence has either been mitigated or eliminated in some way. But what it, regardless, this presence is greatly missed by my clients. They believe that this was instrumental in helping to mitigate many issues. The, there's just not the same sense of security felt with officers in patrol vehicles, according to my client's understanding. There is no doubt concern about the number of police calls regarding the Wally Convenience Store and its neighboring properties. However, please keep in mind that on many locations, like other businesses in the neighborhood, Almez has called the police to her business because individuals are illegally trespassing and loitering on her property. Feel for, for her own safety, she's afraid to confront them and to order them to leave her property. And like other businesses in the neighborhood, she is frustrated that they discourage her legitimate cu customers. Rather than viewing Almaz and Walia Convenience Store as villains, please look at Walia like other businesses in the neighborhood as those simply struggling with the problems currently plaguing the area. The Walia Convenience Store and its possession of an off-sale license is not to blame for the issues in the neighborhood. First, Walia Convenience Store has never permitted anyone to com combine alcohol, consume alcohol on their premises and have never opened a beverage for anybody. In all their years in business, they have never sold an alcoholic beverage to an underage individual. Additionally, my clients frequently find empty cans of alcoholic beverages of varieties not sold in their store on their property, as seen in these photographs. I believe there were some materials that was handed out to the council as well. Do I need to do something here? These pictures were taken just this morning. These are varieties not sold in the store, and my clients have not been selling these vari any varieties of high volume beverages for over a week. But these pictures were taken this morning. 
In fact, although, Wally, as I said, the Wally convenience store has pulled these, these beverages from their shelves, individuals continue to purchase those beverages at other nearby locations that possess off-sale liquor licenses and then dispose of the, the litter on my client's property. Finally, when, my, when Wally convenience store is not open, individuals continue to purchase alcoholic beverages at other areas and my clients and their neighbors have observed individuals walking to other nearby businesses to purchase these types of beverages. Failing to renew the liquor license will not solve these problems, but will only succeed in making business more difficult for a local family-owned business and will be, have the effect of shifting the problem caused by certain individuals to other locations in the neighborhood. But these problems will not be resolved by taking away the license was illustrated just today. When Alma's arrived to open the store in the morning, there were already several individuals on the property who were intoxicated and drinking products that are no longer sold by Walia. These individuals were unruly and rowdy, and Almas felt threatened by their presence. Several individuals, including Mr. Swenson from Handyman, observed this incident and were upset because they believed that Wally had sold these individuals alcohol, but as I've said, Almas show, and then Almas showed Mr. Swenson that their, their, their cooler is now empty and they no longer sell any of these, any of these products. The store is committed to doing what it can to address the issues in the neighborhood. First, the Wally convenience store has installed signage on their property to prevent loitering. They've done this in the past, but often the, t the signs are simply vandalized <coughs> and stolen. They, as I've mentioned, the store has also pulled from its shelves all canned alcoholic beverages with a concentration of 6% alcohol or greater. Here you see the empty shelves that they have. You may have seen media reports of certain beverages being wheeled into the, into the premises, but these were order, ordered before the decision was made to cease the sales, and they are currently sitting unsold in the back of the store. Tyler, I'm going to give you 90 more seconds. You know, you're at the five-minute limit, but we'll keep going here. So. I don't know that we can. All right. Well, in me, 90 more seconds or us total? You. Yeah. you. You guys can each have five minutes if you each need it. The Wally Convenience Store has been working with its neighbors to find common ground to discuss solutions to the problems their neighborhood faces. My clients have followed up on their promises in the last meeting to discuss concerns of neighboring businesses. They've spoken with the Bishop Dudley House, Nikki's La Mexicana, and their na the neighboring barter shop, as well as the individuals representing Handyman. These conversations have led to productive relationships. In particular, I would note the relationship between my clients and Handyman, whose owners, the Swensons, were seen in various media reports regarding this issue. Joe and Steve have indicated their agreement that Handyman and the Wally Convenience Store have a common problem and that failing to renew the license will not solve these issues. The convenience store has taken significant steps in these last weeks, as they promised, to address the council's concerns. Hearing the council's concerns, it has removed the high volume alcoholic liquors from its shelves and has worked to divert, further develop and foster relationships with the New neighborhood. It has, it has worked with the Bishop Dudley House in an attempt to find security to help assist keeping these people off of, off of the premises. The Bishop Dudley House is currently reviewing a list of individuals it believes would be best suited for this task. For these reasons and any others, the Wally Convenience Store believes it is suitable for an off-sale liquor license and asks this council to approve the renewal of their off-sale liquor license. In closing, my client's daughter, Emma Betta, would like to say a few words on behalf of her mother. All right. Thanks, Tyler. Good evening. Hi. Um, my name is Amavit. I was born in Ethiopia in 1995. Um, my mother was a young woman when she left um, her country in the 90s to come to the United States for a better life for me. My mother arrived in the U.S. and found a job at a meat processing plant in Minnesota where she worked for a um, number of years. She worked very hard and was able to save money. Eventually, she saved enough money to buy, um, to own her own store. Um, to purchase her own business, which is Walia Convenience Store. She purchased the store on a contract for deed, and as a result of her hard work, she, she has almost paid it off, that contract, um, entirely in just 10 years. And it is my mother's wish to, to pay off the debt and pass the business on to her family. This country, state, and city have allowed from my mother and myself and Ethiopian immigrants to build a business and obtain an education. I'm currently studying biology at University of South Dakota to plan, and I plan on to apply medical school once I'm finished. Um, she worked hard for 10 years to help me achieve this, and she has done all she can to keep this business. My mother and I want to help our neighborhood. We want our neighborhood to grow. Um, um, 
place where Sioux Falls want to come or where others can start and build businesses like we have. I hope the council will allow the Walia Convia store to keep our license with the changes that have been made to address this, the, your concerns so our family can continue to live the American dream. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you. We'll take a rest of public input first. You guys can grab a seat and we'll see if anyone else is here to speak on this topic. So please come forward. So I'm going to come strong on why Leah's here. It has nothing to do with immigration status. It has nothing to do with living in America and living the dream here. State I've your been, name, please. Sierra Broussard. I've been cleaning Whittier neighborhood up for months. Is it the fault of the police department for not catching a crime? Um, on Walias, I would say that they are catching a crime. They have done a good job in that part of Whittier neighborhood. But I'm going to tell you this. I got a call from a business. She was selling to intoxicated people liquor and she was letting them drink it on her property because the police would make them pour it out when they were on the sidewalk. So these individuals in here that I have pictures of was buying the alcohol from him, from them. When I shook the guy and thought he was dead, the police come and did a breathalyzer four times the legal limit and said he got it from Walias. They're not the only ones that I want to bring up next year for their liquor license. There are two more. We have a gas station up the road that they're talking about with the people that was there this morning with alcohol, with high volume alcohol. The gas station up across the street, up the street here does sell high volume alcohol, but you do not have this problem because they hold people accountable. This is not about the Bishop Dudley. This is not about the neighborhood. This is about her license. The license states that she cannot serve to intoxicated people and you cannot have open container on your property. Now look at this. So we have this one here. And you remember uh, white, white Clay, Nebraska, exploiting the Native Americans? This is what this looks like, because it's Native Americans that go to her facility here. So if you're going to take care of your clients and give them alcohol, then you should be able to provide them a restroom so they won't poop and pee on the sidewalks and outside that is inhumane, okay? So we got this one. Four times the alcohol limit I had to call the police on him for Okay, and then, of course, he goes to detox. Then we have another one here that's sitting by the Mexican restaurant here that got his beer from Malia's. <coughs> got his alcohol from Malia's here. Okay? Then we have another one here. Same thing here for Malia's. Then we have him passed out right here from drinking and getting alcohol from Elias. With all respect to her attorney, I understand that he has to represent his, uh, his clients here. But I'm going to tell you something. I have done a hell of a job in Weeder neighborhood to get the police and the citizens to clean up this neighborhood. When I got that, that phone call from the Mexican store next door, I was frustrated because we have enough to deal with in Whittier neighborhood. Drugs, prostitution, health and code violations, and slum lords. I really didn't have the time to get involved in this chaotic mess. When she applied for that license, she knew what the do's and the don'ts. Jamie, from the, from the license, gave her a picture and sent her a letter Back in 2015, of the do's and the don'ts, and what to do and what not to do, and gave her permission of it. She is very well educated on this. If you're going to sit there and provide alcohol to these individuals, she's sure not taking care of them whatsoever. When you're going to let people use the bathroom outside and say that our restrooms are down for maintenance, that is very inhumane. She wants to talk about coming from another country, and she's a refugee herself. You would think that she wouldn't let people use the restroom outside. And she would let them use the bathroom. 
They couldn't even make it across the street because they were intoxicated. By the time they made it across the street, he fell, this guy right here, and just dropped. And I thought he was dead after I shook him. Four times the legal limit here. Has nothing to do about the Bishop Dudley. Has nothing to do about the transits at all. It's about the irresponsibility of serving alcohol irresponsibly and not taking action and responsibility for her customer's behavior on her property and in that neighborhood. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Anyone else here to speak on this topic tonight? You can speak twice. Again, my name's Catherine Riffle. I'm with the homeless disabled in the city here. I agree about what's being said here with the alcohol. It is very detrimental to the people down there. I myself am on the streets morning, noon, and night, three o'clock in the morning, whatever time, nine o'clock in the morning, five o'clock when you're eating dinner, I'm out there picking them up off the streets, literally picking them up off the streets. I'd give them something to eat and get them some clothing on them, keep them warm and I'd be there while they're vomiting and everything else. I would get them into a safe haven. Everything would be fine. And I'd go back again and do my route again, and lo and behold, there'd be other people on the streets. There was no reason for them to be that intoxicated and without a buddy system. If they're gonna be drinking like that, somebody's gotta be held responsible. And if you're gonna sell the alcohol, you better cover your butt because people are dying and stuff has gotta stop. And that's my territory. Okay, good night. All right, thank you. Anyone else here to speak on this tonight? Uh, Steven Ciano, uh, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, but there was somebody uh, saying that um, these people obviously um, have a mental problem uh, or a social problem. It's not the alcohol. We shouldn't be blaming the alcohol. It's how they handle the alcohol. I certainly... Uh, um, use my share of alcohol and I don't get like that. Um, and I'm sure that plenty of you uh, also uh, use alcohol without such uh, results. And uh, something a couple people have made a point about is, uh, which is what I was wondering about too, is, that, is there uh, toilet facilities? And maybe the city could uh, provide that and solve the problem and maybe it should have some time ago. Um, I know it can be rough for anyone, and somebody who's in a stupor, uh, certainly it could be that much uh, harder for. Thank you. All right, thank you. David Zokaitis here, and I'm an advocate for evidence and data. Well, we've heard kind of conflicting stories from Walia and, and from a public advocate as to whether or not they sell alcohol to intoxicated people. That should be something that the police department investigates. Yeah, it's really hard for a citizen to do that because if you take pictures in secret to get evidence, well, then you're liable for this that, or the other thing. But that's the job for police. And, and they should do it, you know, at random institutions around town, not just Wallius, because people sell alcohol everywhere and we have problems with intoxication everywhere. So it'd be good to see how big of a problem that really is. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. Uh, Grant Hellman, uh, owns some property in the area. I'm kind of going to talk about it in a little different uh, relationship, is about zoning and proper use of a building that wasn't originally designed, I think, for what it's being used for currently. Um, the restrooms are probably from the tw 30s or 40s when this particular old gas station was retrofitted to be a convenience store. Um, when you look at what you know, liquor licenses have to abide by, by the relationship, by the square footage, the use of the property, and, and what the restroom relationship is, what the parking ratios are. I think all of these factors come into play with this particular facility, that it can't abide by the parameters of what building codes would probably, because it's basically being used as a bar. I mean, there were people out front today of that building, particular structure today, drinking outside again. The officers can't do their job because they can't arrest people on private property. So I think 
when you give a license like this to one of the residents of our community and the business of the community, with that, with that license comes responsibility. And I think that responsibility is that if, if you don't feel comfortable you know, telling your patrons that they can't drink on your space, you can call the police officer. And I believe one of the council members said that. How many police initiated calls have been done over the last six or seven years? Not over the last three, three to four weeks. I wanna know what's been done over the last three to four years. Who's initiating these calls? Who's picking up all these airplane bottles of alcohol that are laying around our neighborhood? Who's picking up all the empty beer cans and such? And who's dealing with the ramifications of not having bathrooms that are the proper code for what type of business is being, is being used there. I think all of those things have to come into play because the police officers can't go on that, struct, on that site and arrest somebody unless they walk off of that site with that alcohol. Then the officer can arrest them for an open container. But when they're on that site, they can't do anything about it. And these individuals, they don't, you know, the parking lot requirements don't relate to what type of business is being run there. Most of the people don't have cars. They don't, it's not like they can open the alcohol, they're gonna take the alcohol back somewhere. They don't have anywhere to drink it. They're not getting in their cars and leaving the neighborhood. They're, getting, they're buying their alcohol, opening it up and drinking it, and then the neighborhood's dealing with the ramifications of these overserved individuals. So I, I'm, I'm kind of looking at it more from a little bit different perspective than I think some of the others on here. But there were people out there today outside drinking again. So um, I appreciate your time on this council. Thank you, Grant. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dick here. I'm also a property owner down at, at 8th and Fairfax. And just as I was coming down here tonight, I circled around our building and drove down an alleyway and I stopped and I, by the time I was done, I had counted 22 cans of beer and four empty bottles of vodka. Not the quality of beer that I would drink, nor the quality of the vodka I would have. So it's coming from somewhere. And it's at one or two places in our neighborhood that sell this product, and these people are one of them. We're not asking for anything more than them to become responsible citizens in our neighborhood and responsible business people. I'm in the screen printing and embroidery business. I have made a few t-shirts that I wouldn't wear down here, but I don't put them in my front window. I don't display them in my display cases. You have to be responsible for your neighborhood and responsible for your city. There's some people in our neighborhood that are not being that responsible. Thank you for your time. All right, thanks, Dick. Anyone else to speak on this, sir? Come forward. Good evening. Hi, my name is Steve Swenson. My brothers and I own the handyman store. Um, I don't get nervous talking in front of people and my heart rate is about up to here. Um, The whole thing is a problem. We've been there for 25 years. It was never a problem until about five years ago. Um, and it's, you know, they, they quoted Steve as, as going to Walia today, and I did. Um, they showed me their empty uh, coolers, and they were empty, and there was lots of beer sitting in there. And then, um, do I put this You just sit there, we'll flip it on for you. So they don't have the single-use beer anymore, and they have a liquor license. I understand that. Well, they have lo loaded it up with that so they can sell that to them. So then it took about five minutes today, and um, this is, if you're familiar with the area, that's that purple pet grooming building next to them. That's the front. This, is the, this car is parked right in front of their building. And these people um, are enjoying a little party right, out, fried, right outside the door two or three o'clock this afternoon, um, passing the bottle around, and then, oops, here comes a policeman. So she takes off running to hide the bottle because, you know, they can drink on that place, but not, I mean, it's just ridiculous. And it's, it's a broken record. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I feel like one. And, you know, and it's just more and more and more and all the time and all the time and all the time. My dad used to say, show me what you're going to do. Don't tell me what you're going to do. Show me what you're going to do. And we've seen no changes at all in the past, you know, not just few weeks, many months. It's been 
horrible situation. The whole situation. I'm not saying that the, and I don't, I'm just not a believer that the city should be able to take away the liquor license. I don't know the laws and the rules and stuff, not pretending to. I'm a business guy. I think business people should be able to run their business, you know, make money, pay taxes, and <laughs> go on with life. But um, the, the people, the, the people, the clients, or whatever you call them, I don't think they're called, uh, the other gal called them customer, not, I, I'm sorry, but they're not patrons. They can't drink there. It's not like, you know, there's bars. There's seven bars within one block of there. I mean, they don't cause troubles. Um, um, Phil's Pub is literally touches our building. And I don't think we've, we've had one issue a year or something with those guys. Of, you know, and then it was some customer they had. But um, I could, again, I'll say, I don't think I, it's, I'm not an advocate to, to pull the liquor license because I don't know the rules, but the situation is bad down there. That's, that's what I'll say. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Steve. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dave Jansa. Uh, I'm not no, uh, sure if you're aware that we have a significant alcohol problem in South Dakota. It is larger than other municipal locations in the country, significantly. It's situations like this that lead to that increase. There is something you can do to mitigate the problem that we have, and I think we're facing uh, something like that here tonight. I hope you can take action. I think the people of Olea are good people. I think they're in over their heads. I think it takes a special person to deal with this vulnerable population if you're going to be retailing alcohol to them. And I just don't think they have that skill set. And I think they've demonstrated that. I don't think they're like other businesses in the area, as their attorney said. They're retailing liquor. Dick, you're selling t-shirts. It's a completely different business. And it comes with responsibilities. They've failed at those responsibilities. Uh, the state requires two things personnel, the people that are running it, and the location of the store. It's a pretty simple statute. It was outlined in one of the first meetings. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, they fail at both of those. That's the bottom line. I ask that you do not renew this license. Thank you. Thanks, David. Good evening. Good evening, Council. Uh, thank you. My name is Matt Walls uh, from Sioux Falls. I grew up in this neighborhood. This is this is very special and important to me. And this neighborhood was never this way when I was growing up. Now we have so many safety concerns here. And I, I have four small kids. Would I let my kids run around in this area? I, I wouldn't today. Uh, today I was down by Walia um, with Steve. I was with Steve and. Within the scope of 10 minutes, we saw at least two people walk in, and, and, and they, were, they, they had purchased liquor, and then they were consuming it on the premises. One of those individuals, Steve and I, uh, witnessed uh, there was a woman and a man drinking together, and the man cold-clocked the woman right in the face. We called the police. About 10 seconds later, they were making out. This is, this is very strange behavior in this neighborhood. It's not, we wouldn't tolerate this in other neighborhoods. Uh, some of the pictures that Steve uh, showed you, uh, one of those gentlemen that purchased that liquor was very intoxicated when he stumbled into the store to purchase liquor. And then he was drinking it on the property. You know what that's a recipe for? An ambulance. Who's paying for that? Property taxpayers. Um, when the police talked about uh, police interactions, you know, let us consider the cost of that to taxpayers. Even at a conservative estimate, if an officer is there, he's talking with people, having to write a report, all of this, what is the cost? Maybe 500 bucks? Maybe. Maybe more if there's an ambulance and a ride to detox. Um, talk about 600 of those or so in the past three years. I believe that was about the number. Uh, we're looking at about $100,000 a year just in police interactions at a very conservative rate. I'm sure it's much more than that. Um, but I'd leave it to you guys to do those figures. Who's paying the tab? Um, there's a lot of folks that will say, well, people just need to drink responsibly. But where's the responsibility on the part of the business owner? The key is location. 
And I don't think this is located in the right place. It's less than half a block from our community's largest homeless population and homeless shelter, and within a stone's throw of many great organizations serving vulnerable people. Um, it's located in the former lobby of what used to be Art's Garage. Art's Garage was a two-stall garage. They sold gas. Do you know what the lobby size is? It's so small. For that to be uh, the, the, the place for an off-sale liquor license is, is very, uh, it's an outlier. Show me any other off-sale liquor license that has that type of retail space in this area. There's not one that I am aware of. So it's an outlier. Uh, secondly, um, it's adversely impacting the other businesses in the neighborhood in general. Uh, earlier we heard uh, Mr. Overdale talk about this business as being a victim of its enterprise and of the neighborhood, but that's like talking about a serial arsonist who's burned the neighborhood and burned the neighborhood businesses and then is claiming to be a burn victim. Uh, I don't buy it, and I don't think we should as a body. I think this is, um, it's irresponsible on the part of the business to be operating the way that they are, selling to who they're selling to, especially intoxicated persons and vulnerable persons who have no place to responsibly consume the alcohol that they purchase. I mean, think about that. Any other off-sale packaged liquor, it's to, be, it's to be taken away and consumed at, a, at home or a different location. The neighborhood bars were not having that issue because they have bathrooms, and if somebody's intoxicated, they'll call a cab for the person to be uh, taken home. Uh, this is an outlier in a lot of ways because of the location and the sales and the, the proximity to vulnerable populations. I thank you for your service and your consideration on this issue. All right, Matt, thanks. Any other public input on this topic here? All right, seeing none, uh, before we move on, do any counselors, you have any disclosures of evidence that you received uh, which was not received at this hearing or otherwise posted online? Counselor Neitzer? It's online, but there's a letter from 2015 that was referenced uh, where uh, uh, Jamie Palmer, one of our city employees, sent a letter to Wally uh, informing them of the problems and the need to uh, correct that. There's also a um, email online that followed up from a meeting I had with the chief of police and their staff regarding the numerous issues that have continued to go on, and those are both available online and have been through these hearings. Okay. Councilor Staley? Um, last, I believe it was last Friday, um, I was going into the Sunshine Store downtown, and I ran into Michael, the, the son-in-law of the owner, and um, we had a conversation. Uh, he told me that he had reached out to the businesses and specifically talked about Handyman and um, that there, there was a friendliness happening, um, and he felt good about that. He did indicate at, the, at that time the same thing. The attorney said that he felt that a big cause of this was lack of police presence in the area and that they have the same concerns about loitering and, and uh, littering that the, the business owners do. So he was, uh, I believe, trying to tell me that they were using this deferral time in a positive uh, manner. Um, I did then reach out to this handyman uh, store and I talked with Joe Swenson and uh, asked, and he said that th indeed that they had had a conversation and uh, he was grateful for that. Uh, so just disclosing that those conversations were something that I considered. Okay. Uh, I'm Councilor Brecky. Yes, I did several things. Um, I have had conversations with folks from Keystone and Face It. Um, I was not only looking at this issue in those conversations, I was also looking at future possible legislative topics such as single malt beverage bans or, um, you know, um, zoning restrictions, um, you know, possible alcohol-free zones in the future. However, I did converse with them about the suitability of the person and location, and they did have um, a lot of hands-on information, so I did ask those folks to come and they have came and testified so you received a lot of the information that I did receive in those conversations I thought it was important that the full council have that I also did go to Walia store I went in the store I actually purchased a couple products in there I purchased some lentils and some 
yellow split peas. I did talk to the owner. Um, I, uh, I, in addition to that, after that, after that visit, I actually went to Lewis and looked at what they were selling. I went to Quick Stop and looked at what they were selling. I went over to Nikki's and looked at what they were selling. At all of them were selling a far less limited selection of the single malt beverages at about three times, two or three times the price. Um, and I would also add that when I went into the convenience store, um, you know, for those of you that have not gone inside of it, you know, it's been described as a small lobby. It really is a small lobby. And for me, it doesn't feel like any convenience store I have ever experienced before. And not only did I observe violations of, uh, you know, or did, not only did I, I, I notice that it's just, at that time, was, it was before the, after the first hearing that we had, so it was just a wall of single malt beverage and very little other items in there. But there were other violations that I noticed as a small business owner with regard to the other items they were selling, in fact, the ones that I bought. I mean, there's labeling issues. These items were not labeled. They were not priced. Their ingredients were not listed. Um, there was a lot of things that I observed, again, as having been a small business owner and I happened to be familiar with myself, that made me feel like this wasn't really a convenience store. It was pretending to be a convenience store um, with a real off-sale alcohol license. Um, so I wanted to share, you know, those observations, you know, with the council and the fact that I did make those observations myself. I did talk to the owner. Um, she was very sincere. Um, and, I, and, I, and I do believe what other people have said, a good person. She talked about how hard she worked in her life in her other country. I do think she is a hard worker. Uh, but there are other issues that I wanted to make the council aware of than, other, than, than just the inability to manage the alcohol. And then I would say also I did observe the hard alcohol and um, what was there at that time um, when I saw this most recent picture tonight, there was significantly, significantly more um, hard alcohol in there now than there was when I was in there when the wall of, of beverages was intact. So it's pretty clear that they've traded one thing off for another. Um, Councillor Neitzer, did you have one more item to yeah, put on the I'd record? Yeah, I'd like to thank Councillor Brecky for uh, reminding me that I should also disclose I did go in about a month ago to buy a soda. I kind of just wanted to look around and I did observe what they were selling and I would note the same thing that I didn't see all of that hard alcohol. What I saw was the the rockets and things like that and some of the some of the little things and for what it's worth to the extent it matters, which it might a little bit for me, um, I, I should also mention that uh, my dad actually was a mechanic and he worked at Arts Auto Care for many, many years while I was growing up. And so I know that, that building very, very well. So I have a you know familiarity with it and what it was originally for many years throughout the 1980s. I spent quite a bit of time in that little area you know, while my dad was fixing cars, so. Councilor Erickson. Thank you. Um, I'll go into more detail later, but just my disclosures, I reached out to the Department of Revenue and talked about additional options. And so I'll uh, what the, my information is sitting over there for copies. It's on Sire and all of us have it up here and I'll talk more about that in a moment. All right, thank you. Um, any applicants want to respond to any of that, those items that were entered into the, the record? You, can, you have a chance to do that, Tyler? Sorry. Notes are going to be a bit disjointed here, apologies. Um, a, a recurring theme was that we are, that my clients somehow permit this to happen. They, they walk out of the door and that we just sit there and watch them consume these, the alcohol. We, we, I mean, we try, we make, they make police calls and they, a recurring theme is we hear from the police, we can't do anything. We can't do anything. It's up to you to, it's up to you to deal with it. And I mean, my, these, these people are threatening. I mean, just this morning when my, when my client was dealing with these people who were on her property before she arrived, they, they were very unruly and she was, she was afraid. I mean, this is not something that's just easy to, to deal with. It's not something that's easy to just get these people to leave if, you, if when the police are telling you that they can't do anything about it. Um, the bathroom issue was come up, came up several times. The bathrooms have been updated since the 40s and 50s. That is not an issue. There's not, it's not a common occurrence for them to be down. It's, there's never been a time when they've said, you can't use the bathrooms here for, for, any, for any situation. Um, we, I mean, we are not operating on sale. 
I would, they, my clients reject that utterly. We are not opening beverages for people. We are not intentionally letting these people drink on our premises. It's just they have nowhere else to go, and our efforts at getting them to leave often prove fruitless. Um, Let's see. I just want to make note that Art, Art's Garage did used to sell alcohol because that's where my clients got the license. They bought it from him. So, I mean, that this, is, this license has been in existence long before a lot of these issues have came about. Uh, and the, um, my clients would reject the idea that they are masquerading as a convenience store. 20% of their revenue comes from alcohol. Overwhelming majority, 80% comes from the sale of the groceries to largely the Ethiopian immigrant population. So, and that, that they are not just masquerading to get these, these liquor revenues. That's, that's not true at all. It's only 20% that comes from it. But, so. there, are there any other questions for me or my clients? We'll, uh, you can have a seat, and we'll, uh, we'll call you up if any of the counselors have questions. Uh, what I'm going to do is remind everyone we've got a motion to approve the item uh, that's on the table from our November 18th meeting. So at this point, we can move into discussion, and then counselors, if you do have any questions for the applicants directly that you want to ask them, I'll start with Counselor Kylie, then go to Counselor Erickson. I, I do have uh, a question for the applicants. Uh, received a letter that was forwarded from um, one of our council staff. It was a letter from Michael Almu, uh, dated November 27th. It was sent at 1.52 p.m. that afternoon. We've got a and if you would step forward, please, Michael. In the, in the letter, you state you're going to onboard security staff yes, that sir. will enforce the new rules. Yes, sir. Who is the security staff that you have onboarded? We are still working on it. We have uh, sent out applications and um, are basically working with the Bishop Dudley House's director to vet uh, individuals for us. I could add. Yes. That, Councilman. The reason they're working with the Bishop Dudley House is because it was, it was an idea that came from the Bishop Dudley House. A lot, there's... As Michael mentioned in the last meeting, a large portion of, of these individuals are of Lakota descent. And there is a respect there for certain individuals that they have. And it was the, uh, this is my understanding at least, that if there were to be, if they were to employ certain individuals of Lakota descent who are elders or perhaps that would act as security, these individuals would perhaps be more effective at assisting in getting these individuals off the property. And it's my understanding that that is currently, Bishop Dudley House is currently going through a list of people that it believes would be helpful in this endeavor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael, you had also mentioned that you were going to onboard san sanitation staff. Yes. What's the progress so on that? As, as it stands right now, me and my uh, uh, wife are helping out with sanitation and we are looking into hiring a, on a, a, of hiring a full-time person. Okay, and you had mentioned then in a following paragraph on top of these changes to our operation, Wally Convenience Store is willing to hold a town hall to, to discuss the larger issues at hand. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I've been meeting with all of uh, the, I practically met with just about every business in that street, and I am still working on getting everybody together to uh, have a town hall. Uh, so... I was a counselor that recommended we defer this for two weeks, and then there was another two-week deferral. So despite a four-week deferral period, a month, you haven't been able to put that together. The town hall, no. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Councilor Erickson. Um, I'd like the director of the Bishop Dudley to come up and just maybe address some of the employment. Sure. Um, Madeline Shields, executive director of the Bishop Dudley House. Um, I just want to clarify, um, Michael and his family did come over to the Bishop Dudley House on two occasions. Um, they did come over and say that they were going to stop selling the high alcohol content um, cans and that they were looking for security and they were hoping to hire a service of some kind. And I said, you know, many of our uh, people in the neighborhood may know some of the, the folks um, that do 
frequent their store. And so um, he asked if he could drop off some job applications at the Bishop Dudley House. I said, yes, you certainly can. Um, I'm not working with them to hire or help them hire people, but I would never turn away any job applications uh, for any of the guests or anyone who may come and eat lunch from the neighborhood um, who may be seeking employment. So I just wanted to clarify that, that Michael did drop off some job applications. I gave them to my staff, and they said if they did have anyone that was seeking employment that they would give that to them. I don't know if any of those applications were filled out or if um, they have gone back to Michael. I'm, I have no idea. So. Thank, you. Thank you, Madeline. Um, okay, so when I gave my disclosure, I wanted to just um, talk about in more detail. Um, I've asked Jim to put this up on the screen for everyone. There's copies over there. We all have copies. And I'm going to read this. Bear with me. As we've been going through this process, many of us said, it's either approve or deny, and that's all. And so as many of us started questioning that, going, gosh, don't we have any other options? Can't, can't we put them on probation? Can't we have them come back? And the answer was always no. And so I called, uh, as you know, I used to work for the Department of Revenue. I called Pierre, and I talked to them, and I said, talk to me about how this process works. One, talk to me. If we deny this, can you override us? and approve the license, and they said, no, we will not do that. We don't even see it. I said, okay, good to know. I said, what if we approve it? Will you override us and deny it? And they said, technically we can, but we leave it up to the municipality. We just don't do that. And I said, okay, good to know. I said, I wish we had another option. If we approve this, we don't see them back until December of 2020. And I think that stinks because you can go along and continue the process, so to speak. And so uh, the gentleman I spoke to at the Department of Revenue said, well, actually, 35-2-11.1, recommendation by local governing board for suspension or revocation of license grounds action by secretary. The governing body of a municipality or county may recommend to the secretary following a hearing that any license issued under this title be suspended or revoked for violation of any provisions of this title or for violations of any ordinance or regulation of the governing body relevant to alcoholic beverage control that occurs on the premises of the license. Upon receipt of that recommendation, the secretary shall proceed as provided in 35-2-10 and 35-2-21. The next law then reads, notice of hearing prior to local governing body's recommendation of suspension or revocation. Any action taken by a governing body of a municipality or county pursuant to this 35 dash 2-11.1 shall be preceded by notification to the licensee at that address given uh, on that license at at least 30 days in advance of the date set for public hearing. Notice of public hearing shall be published in the official newspaper of the municipality or county at least one week before the hearing and form approved by the governing body. And so when I saw this, I thought, we have options. We don't just have to say yes for an entire year. We can have them come back next month, February, March, whatever it is, should we feel that we want to do that? If this council decides to approve the license and say, okay, look, here's the deal. I understand this has been going on since 2015 and I'm frustrated. I'm just as frustrated as the next person. Unfortunately, I've been on this council six years and this is the very first time and I don't have my head in the sand. I get about the city a lot. This is the first time that it's really ever, ever come up about this specific location and about all the issues in the neighborhood. Sure, you hear a little bit here and there, but it's never been doomsday like it is now. And so I'm frustrated that this is the first time that we're having this conversation. Uh, we should have been told about it since 2015. The statistics from the police department are quite staggering for many of the areas there. And so I sat down when I got back from here. I met with um, the administration. We talked through what I wanted to do. I couldn't do because of due process. And I, I get I wanted to set a hearing date and say, in six months, you're coming back. However, that can't do that. It's illegal. So for me personally, I intend, now your license, should this council decide to approve it? I have no idea where anyone's voting. But should it go that way, the license will be good until December 31st of 2020 is what the license will say. But the option for this council is to say, you're coming in, we see the violations, if there are violations and the police informs us, we have that option to bring them back in. Maybe when it's a little warmer, when people are moving about the city, 
I don't know. I don't know the best answer. For me, this is the route that I feel is, this is it. This is your chance. And if you choose to not follow the rules and be a responsible business owner, then you're done. It's done. And we'll petition to the state. That's where I'm at right now. Again, I, I have spoken to every single counselor, and I have no idea where anyone is voting. Councilor Neitzer. I totally respect that option, and wherever anybody falls, totally, totally get it. I'll say for me, one of the things that I heard that was very telling was I even heard the council for the applicants say that they are not equipped to handle the problems that are occurring. Their council admitted it. That was very, very important to me. My opposition to this is based on suitable location, and I want to be clear that... Point of order. Are we in council discussion and debate now? Yeah. So there has been a motion? The motion was from November already. Okay. Yeah. So my, my opposition is based on suitable location, and I want to be clear for everybody, because it's, it's very murky, that there's suitable location and suitable person, but the case law that we have says that suitable location is more than just simply the location. It's an entire body that includes the location, the use that's there, and the people that are running it and how they operate the business. And for me, it's that all-encompassing piece. It's not just the location, because we have businesses around there where I'm not hearing any of these problems. It's the, the, the entire part of it that this business, this location, and apparently, and I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, the inability to control the issues. I'm not going to blame them that they're actively letting this go on. Um, I'm just, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt on that. But it just seems to me that I, I don't think they're equipped. I think one of, the, one of the people who testified, I think they said it really well, that they're just probably not equipped to handle this. And for that reason, I'm going to oppose it based on suitable location in, in that entirety. Councilor Shelberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, first of all, kudos to Councilor Erickson for kind of reaching out and going through her leads and finding a different avenue to this. And I think that a few of us had asked that question the last time this came up as far as what are our options? Is there a way to give them some time? And I think at the time we were told there wasn't. So it's, that to me, it's nice to know that at least there's another option here. I am really hesitant to shut down somebody's livelihood. And, uh, but there have been issues here and it's been going on a while, so I'm kind of torn. But I do like this idea that maybe we do have them back in 60, 90 days. We give them a chance uh, to get their stuff in order, and I hope that they will. So I'm, as they say, double secret probation or whatever it is that we'd put you on. I, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys take your opportunity and do your best with it. So that's where I'll be voting. Thank you. Councillor Staley. I'm encouraged that 80% of your business has nothing to do with alcohol. That's a positive. What is troubling to me is the photos that show that you've removed the single serve cans and replaced them with a, a wider stock of liquor. So that's telling me that there's maybe more energy happening with that part of your business than, than perhaps than the 20 percent. But so that, that's, I'm, I think that's problematic. All right. Any other, uh, Councillor Kiley and then Councillor Brecky. Well, for me, I'm, I'm not concerned what percentage is from alcohol, what, what percent uh, is from other goods that you're selling. I, I don't care necessarily what type of alcohol. I mean, after all, you have an alcohol license, you're going to sell, sell alcohol. I'm, I'm bothered more by the, the model that has been demonstrated in the past and going forward here. And my line of questioning before, I mean, we've had a month to get some of these things in place. They're still not there. Uh, I'm concerned about your business model going forward. So it's, and it's, so it has nothing to do with the location next to the Bishop Dudley House, because if I base it on that, I wouldn't be renewing the licenses of the establishments right across the street. So it's got nothing to do with the physical location either. But uh, for me, it's, it's more about your, 
uh, business model, your business acumen. So uh, I'm not inclined to renew this license. Councilor Brecky. I, I share that inclination. I'm inclined to make a decision tonight. I think we've heard more than enough evidence to address the issue of suitable place and suitable person. And sometimes these things evolve. You can start out being a suitable place and being a suitable location, and then all of a sudden a, a period of time goes by and it shifts. I don't know this was you know, ever um, suitable. Best I've been able to hear is that this 10 years ago, this business really started it selling um, the malt beverages out of Coleman coolers. So I question you know, whether this has ever really been a convenience store in the truest sense of the word. So at least at this point, I'm convinced that there's a lot of evidence that would show that, you know, these, that the management is not suitable, you know, for holding a, 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 a off-sale license and uh, that the location is no longer suitable. So, and I'm prepared to make um, that decision tonight. Councilor Starr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I've been pulled back and forth with this. And the reason being is that I don't think this is the solution for the neighborhood. We have, by pulling their license, I th I'm, I'm concerned that we move it to another part and six months from now, rather than being looking at another license, I'm hearing from the residents of the neighborhood. We've cleaned up Whittier Park, but now if they're not able, people aren't able to buy alcohol at this location, they're going to buy it at another location. And now they take over a park that's finally been cleaned up where there are families and people that are able to use uh, the, the Whittier Park especially um, and in that neighborhood. And do we move something just to create a problem somewhere else? But in consistency, I'm complaining about another location in town that has 14 to 1600 police calls a year to their location and sell alcohol. And I've said repeatedly, I'm doing something. I'm tired of it. I'll deal with it somewhere else when it moves, but we've got to do something to make a difference. And that's the side I'm going to come down on tonight is that we've got to do something. And if it is six months or three months from now and the park is overrun again and taken over by people who aren't being appropriate, then I'm going to deal with that problem then. But tonight I have a problem in front of me that's a very small symptom of an overall problem, but we've got to take action and I'm gonna to vote to repeal the license. Councilor Staley. Well, and I, I guess with the people I'm hearing from about Whittier Park, I, I think there still could be a problem there. Um, I'm hearing people from reports from the neighborhood through these past months. But the, the reason I, I talked about the 80% is that there's been talk about taking away someone's livelihood. Okay, and I, you know, we, none of us want to take away someone's livelihood. So it's, to me, that's why I said it's encouraging that if 80% of your business is not related to the alcohol sales, then you can build upon that and, and have a vibrant business, Councillor Kiley. So that's, that's why I, I brought that uh, percentage up. All right, is there any other discussion, Councillor Brecky? Just, no. just one further comment and I would say also one of the things that I, I listened and learned you know, came from testimony um, from the folks from Face It who are well known actually in the country for data collection and they've collected more data on addiction um, than really any other entity in the country. And they said in one of the, the testimonies before us that outlet density is an issue and that limiting it does impact. You know, it's, you know, that in an improper location, if you actually remove the location, you can impact the problem. So there is data that supports doing this um, can make the problem go away, or at least the density of the problem from this area. Maybe we'll have to deal with it in another way, but maybe it will, you know, it will cause a, you know, maybe it will reduce the problem. So I am, you know, am convinced that that possibility occurs in making this decision. All right, uh, I think we've all weighed in on this. I don't see any more discussion. This is the third time we've heard this issue, so I think we're prepared to vote, so I'm gonna call Mr. On. Mayor, would you just restate what we're voting on? Yeah, the motion on the floor is to approve uh, the renewal package uh, liquor license for Wally Convenience Store. So yes, uh, approves their license and no, denies that license. So Tom, we'll take a vote, please. Council Members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? No. Neitzert? No. 
Selberg? Yes. Sale? No. Starr? No. Staley? No. Brecky? No. All right, that item fails six to two. So we will move on to our next item, please. Item 21, new 2019-20 retail malt beverage, South Dakota farm wine license, and new 2020 retail wine and cider license for CSB Incorporated, the Keg East 5216 East Hourhead Parkway with conditional use permit 11065-2019 being approved for October 2nd, 2019, pending final inspections per building services. Item 22, request to include video lottery terminals with the new 2019-20 retail malt beverage South Dakota farm wine license for CSB Incorporated, the Keg East 5216 East Arrowhead Parkway, <coughs> pending final inspections per building services. Item 23, new 2019-20 retail malt beverage South Dakota farm wine license and new 2020 retail wine and cider license for SRS Incorporated East Connections, 3233 South Sycamore Avenue with conditional use permit 11272-2019 being approved on November 6, 2019. Pending plan review and permit issuance per building services and final inspections for health. Item 24, request to include video lottery terminals with the new 2019-20 retail malt beverage South Dakota farm wine license for SRS Incorporated, East Connections, 3233 South Sycamore Avenue. Pending plan review and permit issuance per building services and final inspections per health. Item 25, new 2019-20 retail malt beverage South Dakota wine, li wine license for MG Oil Company. Alpine Sports Bar and Casino, 2, 212 South Sneavy Avenue, Suite 102, pending plan review and permit issuance per building services. Item 26, request to include video lottery terminals with the new 2019-20 retail malt beverage South Dakota farm wine license for MG Oil Company, Alpine Sports Bar and Casino, 2, 212 South Sneavy Avenue, Suite 102, pending plan review and permit issuance per building services. Item 27, transfer of 2019 retail liquor license from KMP Enterprises Incorporated, the club 3301 East 26th Street, Suite 125 to MG Oil Company, Library Bar 2, 5108 South Marion Road, Suite 100, pending final inspections for health. Item 28, request to include video lottery terminals with the transfer of 2019 retail liquor license for MG Oil Company, Library Bar 2, 5108 South Marion Road, Suite 100, pending final inspections for health. And item 29, special one-day liquor license for T-Slat Incorporated, JJ's Wine, Spirit, Cigars, to be operated at Sanford Event Bar in 2510 East 54th Street North for an event on, for events on December 18th, 2019, and January 17th and February 7th, 2020. Good evening, Jamie. Good evening, Jamie Palmer with Licensing. I am happy to answer any questions um, you may have on items 21 through 29, and several of the applicants are here tonight if you have questions for them as well. All right, thanks. Uh, anyone from the public care to speak on any of these topics tonight? All right, counselors, do you have uh, any questions for Jamie or is there a motion? Councilor uh, uh, Starr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, Jamie, is someone here from MG Oil? I guess I've got a question about how we're... I promise I'll be easy and quick. We've gone long enough with alcohol licenses already, so... I, I'm just curious with the Alpine and the library, is it an existing video lottery establishment that you're just now creating into two? Is that the way I'm reading this? Yes. Okay, so then that's taking advantage of what we've done in the, the recent past to, to allow more machines in two locations. So do you plan on having an individual person per um, establishment or will you do it by video as some of the other applicants have. Sir, can you step, step up and can you step up to the podium and just state your name and and my name is Troy Obrumt. I work for MG Oil. I I run music service here in town, which is part of that same company. Um, both of these uh, establishments are are bigger, are more bars. They have more than one um, person working at a time. Perfect. Thank you. That's all I. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any other? Questions for Jamie or someone want to make a motion on this? I would move to approve items 21 through 29. Okay. Second. All right, motion by Star, seconded by Selberg on that. Any discussion, Council? All right, we'll take a vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Eitzert? Yes. Nelberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Yes. Brecky? Yes. All right, those items pass, eight to zero. We'll move on to item 30. Item 30, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by revising Chapter 122, Tattooing. Hi, Alicia. 
Good evening, City Council, Alicia Clara, Health Department. I am here for second reading, amending the ordinance um, for tattooing, Chapter 122. Um, as we've reviewed in my previous um, presentations, primarily our purpose is to incorporate microblading, microblading into the tattoo ordinance, um, which would um, help us bring it into regulation um, through licensing and inspecting. We would also um, ask that um, microblade artists and tattoo artists be required to complete bloodborne pathogen training. We also have some cleanup language recommendations around um, removing the requirements around autoclaves so that um, business owners can, can make those business decisions on sterilization practices and then also updating the language around communicable diseases. So thank you for consideration of these updates. All right, thanks, Alicia. Anyone from the public here to speak on this topic tonight? Bruce Danielson. There was a, uh, something that, in looking at the whole package for this, made me start thinking about uh, some of the th other things that the city doesn't require. Uh, all of these tattoo parlors and owners have to go through a background check for, for uh, height, weight, hair color. In this piece of legislation that, that we're talking about, these people all have to fill all this stuff out. We have all these other businesses like the liquor store, the, the situation we just went through. I don't know that any of these people when you get licensed, these people, they have to fill out all of this personal information. Can ha somebody have a discussion about the requirements that, are, that each one of these businesses are required to have and why we don't do that? Like, we had, a, we had a building downtown collapse a few years ago. That building downtown, we just found out, you know, there's nobody that actually owned anything. It's a... $50 fine that they're going to have, and a, and a man died, and a woman almost died. We don't require any of these people doing business with the city of Sioux Falls. We lost a facade, 30-some thousand dollar facade off of that building that we have no way to get our money back out of that facade. We have an ugly building sitting there now, which doesn't even come close to what used to be in that spot. And we don't care. As a city, I guess we're not supposed to care about that type of stuff. But we have to care that, that we have a tattoo parlor downtown that might want to do this thing called microblading. Uh, it, none of this makes sense. Why do we have to have these people give their firstborn an information, but then we can give Mike Bloomberg all kinds of information, or we can give, we can give away a $30,000 facade so that it can be knocked down because somebody wants to do something special. None of this is making any sense to me whatsoever. Thank you. All right, counselors, do you have any questions for staff on this item? She wanted to. Hi, good evening. Come on up. I'm short. Uh, my name is Liz Jacob. I'm with Beauty Marks by Liz and Apex Inc. I'm an apprentice to be a tattoo artist, and I'm currently doing permanent makeup in Sioux Falls. Um, I traveled to many different states doing conventions. Um, and so I was actually invited here tonight um, to talk about the microblading aspect of it and where it kind of falls as far as the category it stands in. Um, the procedure and everything else falls under a tattooing category. So I guess um, I would agree that if you're going to be microblading, um, you would need the tattoo licensing because that is the procedure. It is, um, it is needle and ink going to skin. Um, as far as bloodborne pathogens training, I do, uh, I do support anyone that would be doing this to be trained properly. Um, it is not something that you want to mess with. It's not something that a cosmetologist can just do without the training. Um, and I wouldn't, I don't really know where it falls under as far as tattooing regulations go because there's not a lot regulated here. Um, but I would like to see more regulations. Um, I wouldn't like to come over and pay $60 and get my tattoo and piercing license and not know how to tattoo or pierce um, because that's pretty much what the city does. So uh, I would move to maybe put more regulations in motion. Um, do you guys have any specific questions as far as the microblading part of it goes? I was, I was going to come for the August meeting, but I was at a convention, so I miss all that. 
Maybe they might. So hang around okay. through this item, and we might call you back up, Liz. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Any anyone else here to speak on this item? Come on up, sir. Hello, uh, my name is Corey Claus, and I'm with Red Arbor Tattoos. Uh, I've been tattooing for about ten years now, and. Uh, no, I'm an international artist, work a lot of conventions, a lot of different states, and uh, I will say that microblading should absolutely be part of this. Uh, I like a lot of the revisions that were made. Uh, I'm all for the bloodborne pathogen training, as I feel that's very necessary. Uh, I enjoyed many of the alterations with this. I think there's still quite a bit that could be done, especially when it comes into licensing. Uh, if you get licensed and then you move from one shop to another, uh, whether you're microblading from the looks of it or tattooing or anything, you have to get a new license at the new shop you're working at, uh, regardless of uh, being in South Dakota. In fact, there's a shop, actually the one that Liz works at, just moved from Minnesota Avenue over to uh, the 26th Street Galleria, and all the artists had to get new licenses to move it when they moved. Uh, so. There's that. There's quite a few other things I went through it, but I do like a lot of the changes that I've started. Um, it does talk about how in this one, if you own a shop, you have to say all your, you have to tell everyone your information, your height, your weight, uh, any officers, directors, and it seems to kind of contradict itself a little bit. Uh, the temporary tattoo establishment license is very misleading and confusing. There's a lot of people that, uh, it's pretty, there's no clear path on how to do it, and it seems it's just the health director's decision whether or not he will or will not, or she or will or will not. Uh, so I'd love to see more clarification on that. Uh, as I said, there's no reciprocity between the licenses, uh, but if you change the, lo the location of an establishment, there's only a $25 fee for the establishment itself, but not the, uh, but the license or the artist had to pay full price. Uh, and I'd also like to see more uh, clarity as far as uh, the communicable disease reporting in 122.070, because it just says report to the department. It doesn't I'm assuming it means the health department, but there is no clear way to do that either. You have to forgive me, I'm a little bit more visual than verbal, so it gets a little bit tough for me to talk being an artist, so. Uh, that's all I have to say on that. All right, thanks for being here, Corey. Anyone else here to speak on this topic then tonight? All right, counselor, do you have any questions for Alicia on this? Just Mr. Counselor Mayor. Starr. Are, are we planning to defer this? Mayor, could I address that? I meant to pass you and give you a note about the next item, and it inadvertently got associated with this one. Your red notes are inaccurate, so. Gotcha. Not planning to defer it. I hope. Well, you can do whatever <laughs> well, you want. I was trying to, no, no, no. I was just. I was trying to figure out what happened all of a sudden, and it popped in there, and I was like, I turned the page, and it wasn't there before. Thank you. That's all I have. Is there a motion we? Uh, can you get on this? Approve second, Kylie. Okay, motion approved by Erickson, seconded by Kylie. Is there a discussion on this, Councillor Neitzer? I, I just want to say I, pr I appreciated what the artist had to say, and I did see our assistant director of health hurriedly type uh, writing some notes, so um, I'm assuming that she will look into it, so I appreciated that. To add a little levity to this night, I will note that in the ordinance there is a strike where there's a, a strike of the requirement for tattoo artists to bathe daily. That currently is an ordinance, <laughs> and we're striking that. So right. just for a little levity. So buyer beware. Yeah, <laughs> we will no longer be enforcing the daily bathing rituals. So. All right. Any other discussion on this one? No, I'll stop. All right. Let's take a vote then. Council members Brecky. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Kylie. Yes. Neitzer. Yes. Selberg. Yes. Sale. Yes. Star. Yes. Daly. Yes. Brecky. All right. Yes, again. Okay, that passes 8 to 0. Uh, item 31, please. Item 31, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at northwest corner of East Madison Street and North Veterans Parkway from the RS Single Family Residential Suburban RD2 Townhome Residential 
suburban RA2 apartment residential moderate density, RA3 apartment residential high density, LW live work, O office, and C2 commercial neighborhood and streetcar districts to the RS single family residential suburban, RD1 twin home duplex residential suburban, RA2 apartment residential moderate density, RA3 apartment residential high density, LW live work, S1 general institutional, CN conservation, C2 commercial neighborhood and streetcar, and C3 commercial community districts number 11263-2019 and amending the official zoning map of the city of Sioux Falls. The planning commission recommends approval seven to, seven to zero. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, January 7th, 2020. Good evening, Jason. Good evening. Uh, Jason Bieber representing Planning and Development Services. Uh, the applicant, Joel Dykstra, is requesting that this uh, first reading uh, be deferred to the January 7th City Council meeting. Uh, Golden Gateway, along with the uh, existing owners of the Canterbury Heights neighborhood, along with some uh, existing neighbors out there, uh, are continuing discussions with, with a, hopefully a solution uh, to kind of help with uh, the existing Canterbury issues as well as uh, the Golden Gateway project. So, All right. Thanks, Jason. Anyone from the public here to speak on this item tonight? All right, counselors, do you have any uh, questions for Jason on that uh, desire to defer? If Mayor, I'll make a motion to defer item uh, 31 to the meeting of January 7, 2020. All right, motion by Councilor Kiley to that effect and seconded by Erickson to defer to the 7th. Uh, any discussion, Council, on that? All right, we'll take a vote on that, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Elberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Bailey? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Okay, that passes 8 to 0. We'll move to item 32. Item 32, first reading in ordinance to the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located north of East 69th Street and west of South Sycamore Avenue from the RA1 apartment residential low density district to the RD2 townhome residential suburban district, number 11328-2019 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. The Planning Commission recommends approval 7 to 0. Recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, January 7, 2020. Uh, the applicant and owner here is Signature Companies. Uh, it's located north of East 69th Street and west of South Sycamore Avenue. Uh, it's roughly 14.14 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is the applicant is looking at constructing a townhome residential development. Thanks, Jason. Anyone from the public here to speak on this item tonight? Council, do you have questions for Jason on this project? Move approval. Second, Kylie. All right, we got a motion by Selbert. Set a date of second reading for Tuesday the 7th. Seconded by Kylie on that. Any discussion, Council? All right, we'll take a vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Staley? Yes. Brecky? <laughs> All right, that passes 7 to 0. Next item. Item 33, first reading in ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota rezoning property located at 2012 East Russell Street from the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban District to the RT1 Single Family Residential Traditional Districts, number 11337-2019 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 7 to 0. Recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, January 7th, 2020. Uh, the applicant here is Ty Tyler Ahrens, the owner is Affordable Housing Solutions. Uh, this property is located north of East Rice Street and west of Interstate 229. It's about 0 .10 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is the applicant is looking at constructing a new single family house on the vacant lot. Great, thanks Jason. Anyone from the public here to speak on this item? Council, do you have questions for Mr. Bieber on this one? Move approval. Second, Kylie. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Kylie to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, January 7. Any discussion? We'll take a vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Okay, that passes seven to zero. Next item. Item 34, first reading in ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota rezoning property located at 1221 West 85th Street from the AG Agriculture District to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban and REC Recreational District. Number 11428-2019 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 7 to 0. Recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, January 7, 2020. 
Uh, the applicant here is Jesse Deffenbaugh. The owner is Lake Alvin LLC. Uh, this is located on 85th Street in Pinewood, just west of the new Walmart on 85th in Minnesota. It's about 2.35 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is the applicant is looking at constructing a single family residential development with roughly four lots and then a lot for uh, a clubhouse with a swimming pool. All right, thanks, Jason. Anyone from the public here to speak on this topic tonight? All right, counselors, any questions for Jason on this one? Move approval. Second, family. All right, motion by Selberg, second by Kylie to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, January 7. Any discussion? We'll take a vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Eitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Daly? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Okay, yeah, that passes eight to zero. Item 35. Item 35, first reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, setting the regular city election day for Tuesday, April 14, 2020, and authorizing a joint election with the Sioux Falls School District number 49-5. Recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, January 7, 2020. I brief that real quick. Tom, your floor is yours. As it notes, uh, the regular election set uh, by charter for the second Tuesday in April. In this case, it's April 14th. If needed, this ordinance also includes a provision for a runoff election, uh, which would be held on May 5th. This does combine with the Sioux Falls School District. The Sioux Falls School District several weeks ago passed a resolution authorizing um, a joint election with us, and now the second part is for us to combine with them. Got it. All right, thanks, Tom. Anyone want to speak on this item from the public? Councilors, do you have any questions on this? Move to set the second reading for Tuesday, January 7th. Second, Kylie. All right. Motion by Erickson, seconded by Kylie on that. Uh, any discussion, Council? All right, we'll take a vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Elberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Daly? Yes. Brecky? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Next item. Item 36, first reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by amending Chapter 30, City Council, Subchapter, Subchapter Council Meetings to restrict any electronic communication at City Council Meetings. Recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, January 7, 2020. Councilor Brecky. Thank you, Council Members. Um, tonight I'm going to present to you the, a proposal for a first reading of an ordinance um, restricting electronic communications. And to begin with, in my presentation, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the history of the telephone, which is, would be one of the items that would be, have some restrictions on it pursuant to this ordinance. And, you know, for a lot of you, I mean, um, this is within your memory, but being my age, I can go back quite a ways, and I can remember when there was one phone on the wall in the dining room in my mother's house throughout all the way through my college years, one phone on the wall. You know, we migrated from that to, you know, phones that could be multiple phones in multiple locations. And that's probably, you know, we're probably talking, when we talk about the telephone and communications, you know, via telephone, we're really probably talking about a hundred year period there. And in that period, to my knowledge, there's never been a phone in the city council chambers when it was, when, you know, it was on the wall in a crank phone when it was, um, you know, on a on a, a you know a phone that you could a council phone like the one there that you can just you know can set anywhere. And I think there was probably a reason for that, and that reason for that is probably because it could be disruptive, and that it would probably be distracting, you know, to have phone calls coming in, you know, during council meetings. The next slide. Um, so I, I I put this up there, you know, to just take you with me on my journey just a little bit as we discuss, you know, the current state of the art technology. You know, we go a hundred years and don't have this issue come up. But now with new technology, this is probably the beginning of a discussion that's going to reoccur and reoccur, you know, probably every two or three years. But I think it's still a discussion that needs to be had. And I think whenever the technology changes, whether it be once in a hundred years or, you know, once every one or two years, um, we need to take a look at our meeting structure and what we're trying to accomplish in our meeting structure and see what kind of accommodations we need to make for that new technology. And so I put this slide up to kind of remind everyone that even though we're not sitting there talking out loud, when we have electronic devices 
in the meeting chambers, we are communicating, and we have, or we have, and or we have the potential to communicate, and so we need to be discussing, I think, as a body, you know, how we feel about that and what communications we're going to allow and agree that should be taking place during our formal meetings and what communications shouldn't. So the next slide. Um, the ordinance that I'm proposing, I, I, I want to just give you a little background and, and history that I went through as I, uh, as I wrestled with this concept. You know, initially, there's really three areas, as best I could tell in my research and study. You know, the first area being a total ban. I mean, there are some cities where they just take a shoebox, they put their phones in them, they turn them over to the city clerk, the city clerk takes the shoebox, and then at the end of the meeting, shoebox goes back and hands everybody their phones. Total ban, you know, no, no cell phones, no other electronic devices in the meeting. The second place, you know, falls down on, you know, sort of a partial ban uh, with some exceptions. And I want to tell you, when I started this, Conceptually, that's the direction I was moving in. A total ban seemed, you know, it seemed like the easiest, cleanest way to do it. But then the more I thought about it, um, the more that didn't seem to recognize the kind of world that we live in and, you know, the kind of technology that and how we're using it to actually assist us in the meeting process. So then I went from that place to, okay, a total ban, that seems unduly restrictive. Um, and I was with the place that I was at when I actually met with you and 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 did a uh, an informational meeting was you know some sort of a ban with uh, some exceptions, and that's kind of where I was at when I had the meeting with you folks. And at that point, I presented no ordinance because I really wanted some dialogue and some input from the rest of the council. And I will tell you that I took your input seriously and in where I eventually landed, because you know I wrestled with that. For a long time, I wrestled with um, an ordinance that, you know, kind of set out a ban, and then I tried to carve out these exceptions, but then enforcement of the sections really, be, it, in enforcement of the exceptions, you know, really became problematic. And so what I did at that point was I actually enlisted the help of, of our staff folks because I, could, I felt like I needed more input, more challenging to what I do, more balance in my thinking. And so I, I want to thank them, and, and I got a tremendous amount of help um, from the city attorney's office, uh, Tom Greco, uh, the city clerk's office, and our own Jim David, um, helped me distill what it was that was really troubling to me about our existing process. And so what you see in front of you is completely different from my original direction, and it was an attempt to not only accommodate your concerns that you raised during the public, uh, during the informational meeting, but it also kind of, it was a flip-flop from going from a ban to what's permitted. You know, what, what is the purpose of our meeting and what needs to be permitted during that meeting? And so we really started with state law. If you look up here, city council members' use of electronic commu communication devices during official meetings shall be limited to researching and or accessing support materials for purposes of official business or public <coughs> policy of the city. That last sentence really is just it's plucked out of state law. That's what we're here to do. That's what we're doing here. We're, we're doing the city's business, the, you know, our public business, and, and we're in our policy setting role. And so, you know, the use of the electronic um, devices to support that makes perfect sense to me. So I'm going, yeah, that's, that's really what I want. I want us to be, you know, if you need those, and you, that's, again, one of the things that came out of the informational meeting, that, you know, you need those for various reasons to feel like you're doing your job. And so, fine, that's, that's where we start, let's start with that. And so the next thing that had come up in the, the uh, informational meeting was there are occasions um, when council members uh, felt, felt very strongly, some felt very strongly, that they needed to have access to their electronic devices in case they needed to deal with some personal, or personal business or, or, uh, or family matters. And so, <coughs> I started thinking about how that might be accommodated, and, and I, I, it really occurred to me that, I mean, we've got one, two, three, four, five doors that, that, that would allow privacy, would allow, uh, you know, just a subliminal exit and return um, to be able to allow people to have it. If it comes in, they can simply slide out, slide back, and, and, and take care of that personal business. And that would not, you know, cause a disruption um, I think to the flow of the meeting and allow them to do that. 
And so that's where that language came from. It was came from an acknowledgement um, that in today's environment, you know, people want that ability, you know, to make those things, you know, to, to uh, take care of those issues. And so that language is in there to accommodate that. You simply slip out, handle that phone call, handle that text message, handle that emergency, whatever it may be, and they can slip back in. And also I, I see that as a self-policing function. That is something where just like tonight, you know, when we were in quasi-judicial mode, you know, and we were disclosing things, you know, that's up, it's similar to that in that the council member can determine when they need to slip out and when they need not to slip out and they control their own destiny and how often or frequently they want to do that. So um, I guess that was my acknowledgement that that was, you know, something that I thought uh, council members was very important to some council members. And then finally, when it, again, I would thank staff for helping me distill what was really troubling to me and why I really felt it was necessary to bring this ordinance forth in the first place. And that is, we have certain rules and regulations that we've agreed to as to how these meetings are structured and what can and can't happen during the meetings. And in these meetings, we have, you know, we've, we've wrestled with public input. We have specific rules for public input. We follow, follow parliamentary rules for when public debate and discussion occurs. And it, it's been our practice, you know, is to, when lobbying occurs and when, it, and when it doesn't occur. And so those were the three things that I was focusing on in this last, <coughs> this last part of my proposed ordinance. And that is, you know, as my understanding and experience has been with lobbying, that when, when the doors close and the one minute announcement occurs and the gavel slams down after that one minute announcement that lobbying is done, that we're no longer allowing ourselves to be lobbied uh, by people because we're here now to conduct the business, you know, make the decision, and we're gonna follow the rules that we've got in place to do that. So, you know, that, that's my understanding. So that, you know, is when that, that, that needs to happen. The next thing that happens is, you know, we have the public input and we have rules to when public in, in, input can be done. And we went to great lengths and, and it was a very difficult issue as we worked through it, but we've got to a place, I think, where everybody's comfortable with how it's being handled. And, and we, I think, are successful on what we, what we have come to on that. Um, so I'm simply saying we need to continue to follow those rules and we can't be allowing public input to happen in some other format you know, beyond the rules that we put in place or else we need to change those rules. And then finally, um, there's a designated time through parliamentary procedure and through our own ordinances to when we engage in public debate and discussion. You know, one that we just finished. You know, are, are we in that period? When we're in that period, then that needs to be when the public debate and discussion occurs. So what I'm basically saying is, you know, the language there is really saying you know, unless we change those rules, then we need to, re, you know, we need to um, follow those rules. And following those rules means that we limit public, public input and city council discussion. Um, it's not permitted through electronic communication devices during the official meeting. So when we're in official meeting, what I call the meeting beneath the meeting, there's no place for a meeting beneath the meeting. We shouldn't be talking to each other. We shouldn't be talking to members of the public. Um, because if we are doing those things, then there is a whole nother meeting opportunity or actually an actuality is taking place you know, outside the realm of the public meetings. And so the following language and the next one just you know, explains you know, what that restriction is or what that is by definition. So for purposes of this section, electronic communication shall mean any text, audio, static images, or video to be exchanged between two or more city council members or a city council member and members of the public in real time or near real time. Examples of electronic communication include, but are not limited to electronic mail, also known as email, instant messaging, chat rooms, text mes messaging, social media, and blogs. One of the things I tried to do, and I'm circling back to where I started at the very beginning is, you know, this issue could, could come up every couple years or so with new electronic devices, but I'm trying to put something together that will hopefully withstand a certain amount of time, you know, because by using the term electronic devices. So even though I've spoken a lot about cell phones, um, it's also designed to address how we utilize our laptops, how we utilize watches, you know, any of those means of electronic communication. As I understand it, the next wave is going to be glasses, 
Um, I think this would probably cover that. So I tried to put something together that wouldn't need to be revisited that often that really um, just parallels what we already have and recommits to what we already have in place, which is there's a time set for lobbying, there's a time set for public input, there's a time set for council discussion, there's ordinances that, that involve that. Um, let's not have a layer of electronic communications that undermines that or that occurs you know, separately outside of those, those processes that we recognize unless we want to make changes to those. And so that's, that's the proposed ordinance. Um, I, would, I would say, the, again, the reason you know, for embarking on this and why I was, you know, I'm persistent with it is because I think it's really important that we establish the kinds of rules in our, in our public meetings that you know, ensure and nurture the trust relationship that we have with the public in the integrity of the process. And so again, the purpose of it is you know, to embellish the, you know, the, the integrity of the process for transparency for public input and also you know, while we're in, in council discussion. Um, my, my proposal attempted, I want you to, to all know, I, I think you know me by now and know that I don't just ignore you when you raise issues, that I seek out your input. Um, I did seek out your input. Um, I couldn't really get folks to collaborate with me and I felt like I needed collaboration. I went to staff and I got some really good help you know, parliamentarily, legally, um, so I put this together uh, in a, what I believe a compromise fashion. I mean, I'm bringing to you something entirely different than where I was originally. Um, I think the proposal attempts to balance good meeting practices and appropriate use of new technologies. Uh, I guess then finally I would just, I said, I, I know again, a, a motivation for it. I just would refer to chapter 34 of city ordinances. And I would just say the stability and proper operation of democratic representative government depends upon the continuing consent of the governed, upon the public confidence and the integrity of the government, and upon responsible exercise of the trust conferred by the people. Government decisions and policy must be made and implemented through proper channels and processes of the governmental structure. City council members must be aware of their obligation to conform their behavior to standards of ethical conduct that warrant the trust of their constituents. All I'm trying to do here, it's really very simple. I'm just trying to say that we have meeting procedures you know, for lobbying, for public input, for council discussion. If we're gonna do something else, then let's change those. If we're not, then let's, let's honor those and take electronic devices out of the mix while those procedures are, while we're, while we're performing those procedures and, and create and ensure um, that trust relationship that we have with the public. And at this point, I take any questions if you have any. We'll uh, open up to public input first. Yeah. There's a second part to this. Part two, all right. Part two, yes. Call me staff member number two here. Um, I am grateful that uh, Councillor Brecky was willing to collaborate with me and the staff <coughs> members in, in talking about this issue. And I see this as setting the standards uh, higher for our behavior within council meetings. As we saw in that last issue we dealt with with the liquor license, those applicants, well, and people sitting in the audience, they, they came up, they were able to speak one time. Now we did allow the applicant to come up a second time, but the, the other citizens in the back got to come up and speak one time. If it would happen, and this has been the practice within some members of our, of our body, that if they would happen to have a cell phone number and a connection or relationship with a council member, they, those people sitting along the back row back there, might be able to text a certain council member with some extra input, guidance, information. And that goes to what Councillor Brecky was talking about with a, a meeting within a meeting. It's, an, it's another layer of input happening. 
I don't think that has integrity for our citizens. It certainly isn't fair to the people who are sitting back there who don't get to come up and speak again. I know it's been, and this has been out there on Facebook, it's been in the newspaper, it's in the media, and people are saying, well, maybe we should allow for people to get input via uh, texts and emails during the council meeting. We already set a precedence for not allowing that when we had that Elmwood issue and a lady called in who was on vacation, she was out of the state, and our, we made a determination she was not allowed to give uh, input over the phone. So we are not taking electronic public input at this time. Um, so I think that it really, this sets a standard for making that a, a policy that we adhere to. Secondly, it, it brings integrity and transparency into our council discussion. When I was elected, I, there was a practice within this group of texting back and forth between us as members. We were doing it. I've seen it happening. That is not, that does not have integrity. So I think limiting our, our speech to what we say publicly has a level of uh, transparency. And I think to me, this, this ordinance is going to help implement that. And lastly, we, when Councillor Brecky and I came forth, and let me say that I have the deepest respect for this Councillor Brecky. She has brought a level of expertise through her, with her legal background and her courage to stand up and to, to speak outside the box. But she has been a firm demander of putting things before the body in the form of an informational meeting. And she doesn't want to just slap something through quickly. So she said, when we started talking about this, we need to have an informational meeting. We're going to ask the council to you know, give them the idea and ask for feedback. And then she also asked to go before the operations committee and speak to them. And, and she was denied that opportunity. So we, we're back again saying that this may not pass this time. If you don't let it go to a second reading, it will be back again because I, I'm, what I'm hearing from our community is that this is the least they can expect from this body. And the last thing I have is that when we brought this up before, we heard concerns that people are saying to us, we can't put our phones away because we have to be able to have communication with our families during the meetings. And also we may be needing to attend our business affairs. And this allows for you to do that. It's just saying, please step outside the chambers if, if that comes up. So again, it's integrity, it's paying attention. And, and I will say personally, if I'm sitting next to someone who's doing a lot of texting and emailing and whispering, whispering, it's very distracting. Thank you. All right, is there anyone from the public wish to speak on this item tonight? I'm David Zokaitis, and I like this proposal. It seems like a great idea. But I might recommend a little bit of simplicity uh, to, um, in the ordinance text. Jim, can you bring it up, please? The, the part in green, we could scratch out a whole lot and, and simplify things as soon as he brings it up. i show you. Uh, where you wrote the section shall not apply, so on and so forth. You could just keep the beginning and the end and drop off the middle. It would read, this section shall not apply to a city council member outside the meeting room. For a little simplicity. But it's a good proposal. I like it. Thank you. Bruce Danielson. Uh, personally, I, I like this a lot, but I see a problem with Section B where I'm seeing you're taking out 7 p.m., or at least the 7 colon 00, and you have something that's going to be p.m. as an at p.m. at. That doesn't even remotely make sense. So there's are we uh, going to be doing this thing where we're going to have a 5.30 city council meeting because of this? Or we might start at 8 o'clock because of this? Or what's a p.m.? Uh, this 
really doesn't even remotely make sense. But in the, in the all in all, over the last six years, I guess I've been coming here, seven years I've been coming here and doing public input, I've, I've learned uh, and I've communicated with at least five of you that are sitting up here on this dais during a meeting, and I could call you all out as to who I'm talking about, and, and, uh, but I don't think that's really necessary at this point. Uh, I believe this needs to be done. I believe that, that an open records request could be made on every one of your cell phones after a contentious battle up here. And if that became a situation, and I see some smirking going on right now as, as I'm saying this, that, and some rolling of eyeballs and other communications that are going on, it's, it doesn't make any sense. You know, I, I could call for an open records request and see what you guys have been doing tonight. And I would, and you know, we might just do that after one of these occasions. You have to learn how to put this stuff away and concentrate on what's going on in this room. And I will definitely be coming up as I watch people play with their cell phones from now on, and I will start asking what's on your cell phone during the meeting. And I'm gonna start doing that, thank you. Anyone else to speak on this tonight? All right, um, should we get a motion on the floor and then we'll move to discussion? Move to approve, Brecky. Second, Staley. All right, so that's a motion by Councilor Brecky to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, January 7th. Seconded by Councilor Staley. Discussion, Council on this item. Councilor Sale. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, earlier today, I had a nice conversation with Councilor Brecky about this, and she expressed some of these concerns, and some of them resonate a little bit with me about decorum in our meetings. The times changed, though. There was a counselor here not too long ago who would just threw a hissy fit if somebody wore a hat while they testified. And there was a time when if the mayor didn't wear a tie, it was a big deal. We have moved on. People that I've talked to lately have said, are you old people on the council going to stop progress in Sioux Falls? You 60-year-old people that are on the council are going to make the rules for the next few generations? These little devices right here, as much as I don't like using one, they're the wave of the future. And this is the way people communicate going forward in the next generation. I think we're a progressive city, not a regressive city. And I, for one, am not willing to move the clock back to 1985. So unfortunately, I will have to oppose your motion. Any other discussion on the council on this? All right, see, Councillor Staley. Well, um, I will tell you, Councillor uh, Sale, that I've been to schools where they're having the kids turn in their phones. Just because we have the cell phone doesn't mean that we get to use it in an unfettered manner. And, and we're not talking about not using a cell phone in our lives. We're talking about the issue of public input. We're talking about the appropriateness of when we use electronics. We're trying to set a standard here. So to say that I can get my phone out and I can be talking on it during the whole meeting is, uh, to me, is somewhat absurd. I mean, I, I do think when people are texting up here, they're trying to do it secretly so you can't really see it. But we're just talking about being open and transparent with what our communications are during this very public meeting. This isn't our private meeting. This is a meeting doing our, the public's business. Um, so I, I don't think we're stepping backwards at all. I think we're being very responsible about saying how we're going to set uh, limitations and, and uh, standards in electronics in our meetings. All right, thank you, Councillor. All right, I don't see any other discussion. So, Councillor Brecky. And I would just say to the, again to my fellow council members, I did... Uh, you know, intentionally try to put this ordinance on so that there would be three weeks, take advantage of the fact that there's three weeks between this meeting and an additional meeting. I, you know, again, I did try to accommodate the items that I heard that came, you know, that came from the council during the information session when there was no draft of anything, when it was just a concept. Um, the reason for that three weeks is, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to shove anything down anybody's throat. I do think it's important that the council set standards, you know, what its, its standards are with regard to technology. I'm open to collaboration. 
Um, I don't know if I've got it right. I'd like you to tell me if I have or I haven't, and I would you know, be willing to collaborate with you in this three-week period. Um, in addition <coughs> to that, if I'm even open to the, the concept of if this shouldn't be an ordinance and it should be you know, a policy as part of our policy manual ran through our operations committee, I think it could be done either way, but I do think that um, it is something that is important you know, for the integrity of our process, and I really would like to collaborate with my fellow council members on it. All right, seeing no other discussion, I'm going to call on a vote on this, please. Council members Erickson? No. Kylie? No. Neitzer? No. Selberg? No. Sale? No. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. All right, that item fails, five to three. We'll move on to our next item, please. Item 37, a resolution advising and giving consent to the appointment of members to certain citizen boards, those being Rex Hambrock to the Building Board of Appeals, Chris Lydell to the Infrastructure Review Advisory Board, Anthony Bullis and Brian Ike to the Plumbing Board of Appeals and Examiners. All right, uh, kind of a motion to approve these uh, gentlemen here. Move to approve Erickson. Second, Kelly. All right, motion approved by Erickson, seconded by Kylie. Any discussion, Council? All right, we'll vote on these guys, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Next item. Item 38, a resolution establishing the City of Sioux Falls legislative priorities for the 2020 State Legislative Session. Hello, Jim. Good evening, Council Members. Jim David, Operations Manager. For your consideration tonight are 21 legislative priorities for the 2020 session. This process actually began with some key partners, Sioux Falls, Harrisburg, Minnehaha County, T Baltic, Del Rapids, the South Dakota Municipal League, and also local legislators. This has been an extensive process that began at the beginning of this summer and culminated in the provisional resolution that was adopted by this body on August 20th. Since that time, there's been a legislative breakfast to receive input from area legislators, and then we had an informational meeting last week. Tonight, after final adoption, this will be delivered to area legislators and also to the Municipal League to provide them with the information before they begin the legislative session on January 14th. So if we look at the resolution, I'm not going to go through each individual item, but I'm going to highlight a few of them. Item one is one that has been there for the last couple of years. There has been some success. Four and a half million dollars was appropriated uh, to, for the P25 upgrade. Uh, in the governor's latest address, she's proposing $5.1 million that go towards that. Some of the improvements include uh, those to uh, different cell towers or towers that have uh, been in existence since the 60s and the 70s. The next item we'll talk about is item five. This is actually a non-city item. This was an item brought forward by Minnehaha County. They are proposing to, uh, they are proposing a bed, booze, and board tax to fund law enforcement, and so they, they will be putting forward an effort during this upcoming session. Moving on to item seven. Uh, this is uh, an item that uh, has been amended from time to time. Uh, the governor did propose $3.7 million in her budget with $3 million for intensive care or intensive meth care. And then going over, I'm going to kind of just drive around here for a little bit till I get to item 21. <coughs> uh, this item was amended uh, by Councillor Brecky, and it would institute a 211 system across the state. And this actually originated from an interim committee uh, from this summer. Uh, chaired by uh, Senator Soholt, and she is proposing that a 211 system be available to all citizens uh, throughout the state. So, looking ahead, we're going to have a Good Morning Sioux Falls breakfast on January 9th. The session begins on January 14th, and then we do have some legislative coffees that will take place at the hub at Southeast Tech, and then, of course, there's Municipal Day at the legislature on February 5th and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. All right, thanks, Jim. Nice use of Prezi, too. Is that a Prezi presentation? Yeah. Yep. Well done, man. <laughs> I like it. All right, anybody from the public here to speak on any of these items tonight? All right. Um, counselors, this is your item, so let's get a motion, and we can move into discussion on it. Move to approve, Erickson. 
Second, Sale. All right, motion approved by Councillor Erickson and seconded by Councillor Sale. Discussion on this, Council? Councillor Erickson. First, I just want to say thanks to Jim. He keeps us on task and moving along. Um, without his due diligence and research through many of these items and helping communicate it with the other partners, this, this list wouldn't be half as good as it is. So for all the work that you've done, Jim, it's appreciated and um, you're certainly an asset um, to this group. So thank you for that. Other discussion on the council on this? All right, seeing none, well, I'm gonna call in a vote on this. It, Mr. I'd like to, to may, I'm gonna make an yeah. amendment. Um, I make a motion to amend this, the list of priorities by adding the following legislative priority. The Sioux Falls City Council supports legislation prohibiting nepotism in state government. Second, Star. All right, uh, a motion and a second on a amendment to the original motion. Councillor Steele, you want to? And I'm, that? I'm just bringing that up because I know um, from what I was hearing in the news that I think our retiring legislator, Stace Nelson, had brought up some legislation about this last year within state government. And so I think we were having a discussion about it now, and it's certainly worthy of, of a conversation. Okay. Uh, any other discussion on that? Okay, let's take a vote on that amendment, please. Council members Erickson? No. Kylie? No. Neitzer? No. Selberg? No. Sale? No. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? No. All right, that amendment fails six to two, so we're at the original main motion. Any other discussion, Council? All right, let's vote on this then, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. All right, that item passes eight to zero. We'll move on to uh, item 39. Item 39. A resolution approving the 2020 audit plan. Uh, uh, Councilor Neitzer, we'll start with you on this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to start and I'm going to ask our internal audit manager to come up to finish the presentation. Each year, the City Council adopts an audit plan for the upcoming year, which tells the audit staff what areas to audit. The plan is drafted by the internal audit manager based on a number of factors and input from stakeholders. The proposed audit plan is reviewed by the Audit Committee and forwarded to the City Council for final approval. The plan presented to the Audit Committee included 13 recommended audits. The Audit Committee added two items to the plan, which gives us a total of 15 audits. As the Audit Chair, I'm going to address the two audits the Audit Committee recommended, and then I'm going to ask our Internal Audit Manager to discuss the items that she has recommended. Before that, I want to address the issue of conflicts. Conflicts are not uncommon in the audit world. When conflicts exist, they need to be disclosed and addressed appropriately. Recusal is a common way to address conflicts. We're all aware that our Audit Manager has a conflict as it relates to the parking system. We knew that going in. I felt strongly, as I still do, that the synergies and benefits of having a manager with deep institutional knowledge far outweigh the downside of having the conflict. All of us understand the conflict, and our internal audit manager agrees that the recusal from audits related to parking enterprises is the appropriate thing to do. But we need a policy to guide us as we go forward, and it needs to be in writing and approved by the audit committee so that we all understand how the process will work, and we all agree to the ground rules going in. So a conflict of interest policy is not uncommon for an audit function to have, and we need to create that. As audit chair, I intend to work with the audit committee and audit staff to develop that policy so we can deal with the conflicts and know how we will handle them going forward. Until that policy is adopted, I've directed our internal audit manager to refrain from any discussions or actions related to any actual or potential audits of any component of the parking enterprise going forward. And we have some ground rules that the city attorney helped us with. I should have done that sooner. That's on me for putting her in the position of being even asked about the audit of parking at the audit committee meeting. She's been directed going forward to answer, to address any questions to me as audit chair. For that reason, I'm gonna discuss the parking related audit. And once the policy is created, we can move forward. So with that, the two audits that the audit committee recommended were, one was a capital expenditures audit, and the second is an externally contracted audit of the parking enterprise system. And with that, I'm gonna invite our internal audit manager, Shauna Nelson, to come up to introduce the item she is recommending that we audit in 2020. Thank you. Hi, Shauna. Hi, good afternoon, evening, night. It's almost tomorrow morning. <laughs> right. 
Shauna Nelson, Internal Audit Manager, here to present the 2020 audit plan. On December 2nd, I presented a very aggressive audit plan that included 13 audits for the 2020 calendar year. As Councilor Neitzer just briefed you, two more items have been added to the plan. If this plan is adopted, we'll be scheduling a meeting with the audit committee in early 2020 to prioritize these audits <clears throat> for scheduling for the 2020 calendar year. And with that, I'll go into the items on the audit, on the 2020 audit plan. The plan consists of four carryover audits. One of them is in the performing phase and, in, and is conducting field work and testing phase of the audit currently. Two are in the planning stage with leaving one that hasn't been started yet in 2020 and the one that hasn't been started yet is the damage recovery billing process for public works. We have five assurance audits that includes the travel expenditure which was already in a previous audit plan and it continues from the PCARD audit that was done um, earlier in this year. The Midco, Midco Aquatic Center cash handling process the remittance of the bid tax collection process and the 340B pharmacy contract. That includes the eligibility registration and policy and procedures. And you've already heard about the capital expenditures from Councilor Neitzert. We have two additional consulting audits. Um, that is the security access of city buildings and the fraud task force. These consulting audits are requested from the administration to be proactive and review current processes that are in place to verify controls that might mitigate the risk. We also have two follow-up audits, the purchasing card program audit that we presented earlier this year, as well as the landfill licensing process that we um, presented to you earlier tonight. The, these audits followed up on recommendations that we implemented this year. And with that, any questions? All right, thank you, ma'am. Anyone from the public here to speak on this topic tonight? All right, counselors, do you have any questions for Shauna on this? All right, look for a um, motion. Move to approve. Second, Neitzert. All right, motion approved by Kylie, seconded by Neitzert. Uh, any discussion on this council? All right, seeing none, we'll take a vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Melberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero, item 40. Item 40, notice of transfer of appropriations on the memorandum dated November 30th, 2019. All right, uh, any new business council? Move to adjourn, Star. Second, Erickson. All right, motion adjourned by Star and seconded by Erickson. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Merry Christmas. Merry Have a good Christmas. night.